Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of Reddit Podcast Stories, where today, Karen mocks me at my party, so I pulled off her wig in front of everyone. I, 26 female, had a bachelorette party on Saturday. It was a homely affair, as I'm not the type to go out of town and get drunk. It was a dinner for people I know and their guests at the church recreation center, which my parents spent a good deal of money on to make it seem nice. It was followed by gift opening. At this party, one of my friends brought Helen, someone that I'm not close to, but she is in the friend group. About two years ago, I slowly started to distance myself from her as she has shown some jealous tendencies that she masks as others being jealous of her. She's two years older than me. I've never liked her, but you have to respect the plus one on your guest list, even if she wasn't on the RSVP list. Or at least that's what my mother told me. During the gift opening, she made some remarks about how so-and-so decided to wear the same shoes as her because she gets copied a lot for her fashion sense, made a remark about cheap extensions another guest wore, and insulted the dress my niece was wearing as well. I took Siobhan aside as it was her guest, and I told her to keep her under control. She promised that she would. When we cleared the floor for dancing, instead of helping, she went around and pulled down my ratty decorations. I asked her politely to leave if this wasn't her scene. She turned around and accused me of taking her leftovers as she said that she had hooked up with Andrew. My fiancé's name is Michael. Andrew is his brother who's three years older than him. She patted my stomach and said, Yep, you are pregnant. Why else would you be getting married before me? She even made a comment about me waiting to the last year of secondary school to get taller than her to steal away all the boys' attention to spite her. I'm 5'5 five five and she's 5 foot. I had a growth spurt and it's not something that I could control. She picked up my hairdo and said I even copied her hair color. It's my natural auburn that I've had my whole life. I grabbed her by the hair to pull her towards the door as she kept knocking my hand away when I tried to grab her by the arm. That's when the wig came off. She ran out on her own crying. Am I the jerk for how this went down? My mother thinks that I was not the best host and that my generation is too individualistic to be hosting with manners. Siobhan said that I should have just let her come out of the toilet instead of dealing with it myself as Helen has been feeling down lately. The guy she was with dumped her a few months ago after two years because he didn't want to get married, but Helen found out that he's getting married to the girlfriend he has been with for under two months. Of course, that made me the bad guy. Siobhan said that I was quite insensitive. You were insensitive? She has to be joking, right? Because how the heck is someone going to talk smack and trash at your bachelorette party about you, and when you snap, you're the bad guy? I would have started throwing hands and not just grab her by the hair. Having a hard time is not an excuse. I'm sick of hearing that when people like Helen use it. But it's not an excuse on what she did to you. It may be a factor, but it's not an excuse. She seems like the type, I'm having a bad day, so I'm going to make it everyone else's problem too. Also, get new friends. I'm talking about Siobhan. Not the jerk. Not the jerk. She needed to be brought down a few pegs. She's awful to people and deserved a bit of humiliation. She's been feeling down because no one wants anything to do with her. Don't feel bad. Even if you asked her to leave politely, I don't think she would have, just to be a jerk. You are awesome. Since when does Reddit applaud physical assault when someone says something you don't like? Well, let's be honest, it just depends on who's doing the assaulting. That's absolutely right. Gotta love Reddit. My 72-year-old mother-in-law threw away my things, so I kicked her out of my house. I, 36 female, live with my husband, 41 male. I have a decent relationship with my mother-in-law, compared to a lot of the horror stories I hear from friends. She's quite sweet and warm. She is, however, a little over-controlling, overprotective. I'm not sure of the exact word, but she has very strong ideas about things and no sense of boundaries. For example, when she stays at our house, she takes over the kitchen completely and insists on cooking all of our meals. She cooks wonderfully, but she won't let me help her at all and puts everything away in the wrong places and then insists that her way is more logical. She only really comes over for holidays though, and I do like her a lot, so I don't mind putting up with these mild annoyances. I'm currently pregnant with our daughter, who will be born in a few months. This is a miracle. I really didn't think it would happen, especially so late, but we got lucky. When my mother-in-law heard, she was super excited and said she would come over to help us get ready for the baby. She offered to stay for the next six months or so to help out because my husband and I both work long hours and it will be hard to handle the baby on top of this. 
She's also pretty emotionally invested in this because she truly sees herself as part of our family. She arrived a few days ago and set herself up, then she started with the cleaning. I like collecting things from garage sales and such. Things like sculptures and books and baskets. Stuff a lot of people would consider utter junk. Our house is definitely overstuffed, but it's reasonably tidy and doesn't seem like a hoarder's house or anything. My mother-in-law, on the other hand, likes everything surgically clean. Yesterday, I came home from work to find the house like a war zone. She went through my cabinets and cleared out everything she considered junk and had apparently made several trips to Goodwill before I got home. I was really angry and I asked her why she would even do this. She said that the house has to be tidy for the baby and that it would be dangerous for the baby to be in my cluttered house. Then she took the next huge bag of stuff and tried to walk out the door. I kind of lost it and I told her that she could get out right now. She was shocked that I was serious and she said she doesn't have anywhere to go and it's late. It was 9.30. I booked her a hotel room and I called a taxi. My husband came home an hour later and when I told him what had happened, he was furious with me. He says I disrespected his mom and was ungrateful for everything she's trying to do for us. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk, but you may want to consider why she did that. Your house may actually be cluttered with junk and she was helping. I, of course, don't have like photos of your house in its previous state, but what she did was a jerk move. Am I the jerk for getting mad at my roommate after she didn't feed the dogs? I, 18 female, have a roommate who's 26, also female. We rent a house together. I have two dogs. I got them when I moved in. They're about a year. They've been with both her and I since they were puppies. Despite this, I've never asked her to watch them, clean up after them, feed them, or do anything with them. They're my dogs. Recently, she told me that she wants to get more involved with them since she calls them her dogs and she posts pictures about how much she loves her dogs and things like that. I thought it would be good for them to have another person they could trust and it would be good for me because as a full-time student with a job, it's hard to take care of them all the time. The other day, I woke up at 6.30 to go to the gym. One of my classes was moved around so I needed to go earlier. The dogs are usually fed at 7. I texted her and asked if she would feed them at 7. She said yes. I got home around 8 and they were barking and their bowls were empty. I went to her room to ask her if she fed them and she said she forgot. I didn't care too much. It was a mistake. I was just mildly annoyed. So I fed them and went about my day. A few days later, she asked to take them on their walk, which was great for me because that meant I could get some overtime. I agreed and showed her where everything was. But when I got home from work around midnight, the dogs were sitting by the door. They ran over to their leashes and harnesses. So I asked if she took them on a walk. She was sitting on the couch and she told me that she was going to, but it was too cold out for her, so she didn't. It was 15 Celsius, 60 Fahrenheit, so I took them out at midnight. If I didn't, they wouldn't have slept. Now this morning, I decided to give her one more chance because I had an early class. Usually on these days, I'll just feed them before I leave, but when I make their breakfast, I warm it up for them, and I feel bad leaving it out to get cold. I knocked on her door at 6 a.m. before I left for the gym. She told me she would feed them at 7. I had to go right from the gym to school or else I'd be late. I told her that, saying I wouldn't be there if she forgot to feed them. She rolled her eyes and said, I'm an adult. I know how to feed dogs. I got home at 3.15 p.m. The dogs were laying by their bowls. So I went to her room. She's home all day, remote job. When I got there, I asked if she fed the dogs and she said, Oh, that's what I was forgetting. Can you do it since you're home now? I got mad at her and basically told her she was incompetent and that I hope she never gets a pet of her own because it wouldn't survive. Now her friends are texting me and telling me I was too harsh. Am I the jerk? Edit. I only felt comfortable taking overtime and shifting my class schedule around because my roommate said that she would help me. My dogs are very well taken care of with three homemade meals. They're on a raw diet, but I gave my roommate detailed instructions. Two walks, an hour of playtime a day, I wouldn't have gotten dogs if I couldn't take care of them. This post is about my roommate repeatedly failing to do things she said she would do. As I mentioned, I do take care of my dogs on a very consistent schedule, which is why I was so upset that she didn't feed them when she said she would. There's only one day a week they're not fed at the same time, and it doesn't seem to bother them. It just makes me feel bad for their food getting a little cold while they're sleeping in. But I do take them for walks before their breakfast, and then again before bed. However, they have a doggy door, meaning the house has a backyard, so they're always free to run around. 
I give them three meals a day, and then when I get home, we play fetch for an hour or two, until they don't want to play anymore. While my schedule is full, I wouldn't have gotten animals if I couldn't take care of them. It wouldn't have been fair to them. Your issue is that your roommate is a liar. Get a new one. OP. The lease is up at the end of November. I've been talking to a few other friends and we're considering renting a house closer to our school and I actually trust them with the dogs, so I'll probably do that. Raw diet is bad for dogs. OP. I totally hear you on this and there are definitely some that are, but don't worry. All of their food I pre-check with their vet beforehand to make sure they'll be okay to eat. One of them has some tummy issues and kibble is too harsh for her and the other gets jealous if they have different meals. Update. First, to all the people concerned with my dog's diet, thank you. I also got nervous when I got a few PMs about how vets are basically BSing when they talk about it. I called my vet to ask what the deal was and if their food really is safe and they sent me their credentials for canine nutrition. So worry no more, they're in good hands. Second, there seemed to be some confusion, which honestly is a little funny. I'm the 18 year old and my roommate is 26. Third, my dogs are microchipped and have been for a few months since they were old enough to get them and they're registered to me, so don't worry about that. But again, thank you so much for your concern, it means a lot to me. And please stop saying I don't have the ability to take care of my pets, I do. I schedule things around them. Like I said in the edit, I only felt comfortable moving things around after she offered to help me. And lastly, I spoke to her friends. I took a few of them out to lunch today and they told me she had said that I yelled at her after she gave them the wrong food. They believed it because admittedly, I am very particular about what they eat. But that's mostly because as I said to someone in the replies, one of them has stomach issues. I cleared it up and they apologized. All but one of them, which honestly I don't care too much. I'll be moving out and won't ever talk to them again most likely anyways. Have you noticed how the commenters on Reddit always try to tell people what they're doing wrong with their pets? Sometimes I think they're just looking for an outlet to complain. Am I the jerk for showing up at my girlfriend's unannounced? I, 25 male, showed up to my girlfriend's, 30 female, unannounced after she said she didn't feel good. It's not far from me so I made the decision to stop and check in on her just to see if she needed anything. It's her mother's house. It was 8.41 p.m. when I got there and I left by 8.43 for time reference. We've been together for a little over a month and I've been over there later at night dropping things off or working on something. I tapped on the door three to four times and a very slight knock using just one of my knuckles and I said a gift I had gotten her on the front chair, a Halloween wreath for her Jeep. Nobody answered the door so I just shrugged and left thinking nothing of it. I came to find out that she's upset with me and her mother said I banged on the door and I was there at 10 p.m. and now her mother feels unsafe in her house. I'm very confused because I've never had someone get upset with me for that, especially after I've been there before, met them, and been on vacation with her daughter a couple of times already. My girlfriend was also inside but didn't even hear my knocks and was asleep, so she didn't even know I was there. Any advice would be greatly appreciated because I don't think I did anything wrong. Not the jerk. Her mom is for lying. That aside, you said she let you know she wasn't feeling well and didn't want to make plans that day. And in another comment, you said she has a habit of letting her phone die. I'd be really creeped out if a boyfriend of a month stopped by my house unannounced, especially because it seems like she wasn't answering your texts. It's not cool to go over to someone's house when they're not answering your texts. Unless you're in an established, longer relationship, someone not answering you or answering you by saying they don't feel well means don't come over, I don't want company. Not come over and bother me at 9 p.m. OP. I can understand that. I didn't have any intention of anything longer than, hey, how are you feeling? And leaving. But I get what you mean. It doesn't matter what your intentions are. I would call her behavior establishing a boundary that she didn't want to chill that night. You convinced yourself you had a good reason to ignore her boundary. No. It doesn't matter your intention. If someone establishes a boundary, respect it. With that being said, you sound like a good dude. I would chalk this up to a life lesson. Ask your girlfriend if you could get her and her mom apology flowers or take them out or something. And next time she doesn't want to hang out, don't show up. OP. I wasn't trying to hang out there. I was only stopping, like I said, for a hey on the porch. Then I was gone. This is the first time this has come up and it wasn't an established boundary. I know that now it's a big problem. Thank you though. I know a lot of people say thank you condescendingly, but seriously, 
I appreciate everyone's comments, even the less than friendly ones. You're the jerk. Going to someone's house unannounced when you've only been seeing them for a month is not okay. I would have been upset too. You're the jerk. Major stalker vibes from you. Let me guess, you're just a nice guy, right? And guys like you wonder why we choose the bad boys. Gee, maybe because they don't show up at our house in the middle of the night like some psycho scaring the crap out of our moms. Hope you learn to stop being such a creep and thinking life is some stupid romantic comedy where us women will love you for being a weirdo. Dude, no woman wants you knocking on their door at that time, especially unannounced. Do you even know the world we live in? OP Where I live, as I've written before, people leave doors unlocked and garages open. Also where I live, 8.40pm is not late. I work until 8pm a lot of days. I live in that kind of place too. You still don't drop in unannounced when you don't know someone well. It's called manners, especially when they turned you down in the first place, especially at night. You keep making excuses rather than listening to women tell you that this is the kind of thing that can be genuinely terrifying. And even here in a safe neighborhood, I've still been harassed. Second, oh, but I think it's fine, so I don't care about seeing it from their point of view. You might not think 9 p.m. is late, but I also worked until 8 p.m. a while ago, and I knew that everyone else was on a different schedule, so my normal was there late. Of course it was. The road to heck is paved with good intentions and a proper apology means understanding why you upset them and acknowledging that. Since you're still saying all of these, oh, buts, I'm betting that apology wasn't a good one. You're the jerk. Not the jerk. I think this sounds very sweet of you. If I was dating a man and he showed up to check on me after I said I wasn't feeling well, I would know he's a keeper. Then again, I don't live in America, so perhaps it's a cultural thing. In my country, this act would be seen as caring and protective. These are values that we appreciate in men, and it makes them highly desirable to us. Actually, I have seen many posts where the men are called creepy, but in my country, these acts would not be called creepy at all. My sister and I joke that the reason birth rates are dropping in the US is because men are afraid to approach women now for fear of being called creepy. Am I the jerk for causing everyone to stop helping my sister-in-law? My husband has a sister who he'll call M. M and her husband have four kids. Both M and her husband are very loud and always angry and fighting over something, so we don't talk to them much. Recently, the kids were removed from their care and placed in the care of my mother-in-law. M has asked everyone in the family to help them. They need their home cleaned and several other things, so I went to their home to help. I had no idea how bad their home was. I haven't been there in years. They have a serious roach infestation. Not the big wood roaches that come in sometimes, I'm talking about the little disgusting ones that get into everything and you can't get rid of and they'll take your home with you by accident. They also had wall-to-wall -wall stacks of trash and just about everything imaginable on the floors and counters. I couldn't even see the floor in most places. So we cleaned and cleaned and my husband and father-in-law paid for a dumpster to be brought. It took us several days of cleaning to even see the floors and we still have tons more to do. I'm terrified of roaches, so I wear gloves and coveralls and I'm trying to do my best to not panic. However, I've been ridiculously paranoid since starting this. I can feel them crawling on me even when I know I'm clean fresh out of the shower. I refuse to bring any of these roaches with me home. I change into fresh clothes before getting in the car to leave and I shove everything I wore into a garbage bag to wash immediately when I get home. Apparently, M saw me doing this. She got angry and asked if I thought I was better than her and made it a huge issue. Honestly, I just don't want roaches in my house at all. They're gross and terrifying and near impossible to get rid of. I tried to explain, but she just got angrier, so I just told her if this was her way of thanking me for my help, I can leave and she can do it herself. Several other people saw this and now no one is helping her anymore. I feel awful about it. I know she definitely needs help and didn't mean for any of this. I feel like a jerk. Edit. I didn't even think about bed bugs and other things. I was just freaking out over the roaches. Now I'm more paranoid and my husband and I are searching the house to make sure nothing came home with us. Though the washer is in a room of its own connected to the carport and I wash everything as soon as I get home and then I shower. I did braid my hair and had it up so nothing could really get into it. Hopefully I didn't bring anything home. Not the jerk. OP, you've done nothing wrong at all. I would be doing exactly the same. There's roaches, but there could be fleas or bed bugs and all sorts of things in that house. Your sister-in-law is clearly projecting on you because she must be embarrassed at how bad things have become 
But that's no excuse to attack you when you were being helpful and also extremely sensible in what you're doing with your clothes, etc. Don't worry about feeling like a jerk. Your sister-in-law needs to stop being so dirty and start cleaning. My boyfriend says he will break up with me if we don't have a baby. I, 32 female, have been together with my boyfriend, 32 male, for four years. Since we started dating, we talked about and made sure we were on the same page about not wanting to have kids. We've been happily dating since then, and I have truly felt like I found my soulmate. We haven't talked about having kids again, and so I assume nothing had changed, until yesterday. We were on a crowded bus in the middle of the city center on our way to meet his mom and sister when he says that we have to get off and that he has something to tell me. So we get off and he starts crying, saying that he has realized that he wants to have kids and can't imagine a future without having at least one and that it has become more important to him than being with me and that we have to break up if I don't change my mind. I was really shocked. I had no idea he had been having these thoughts, but apparently he's been thinking about this for several months. I feel so betrayed that he didn't include me earlier on his thoughts and that it's gone so far that he wants to break up basically right away if I don't say yes. We don't even live together yet. The last year we have spent hunting for apartments and we are not financially stable enough yet either to even consider having a baby, which he now says he needs within a year. I told him that I don't want a baby right now and that giving me this weird ultimatum from out of nowhere is really unfair because he has had a lot of time to think about this, but I haven't. And I don't feel good about making the decision to have one under these circumstances either because to some extent it would be out of fear of losing him. I'm so mad at him because if he had clued me in on this earlier, we could have had a conversation about it and I could have considered having a baby with him. We talked all night and he has agreed to give me some time to think about if I want to have a baby with him and I honestly do not know what to do. If I say no, I lose the love of my life and if I say yes, I don't know if it would be a decision I make out of fear. What should I do? If you don't want kids, then let him break up with you. You're no longer compatible. If you're unsure, then give it some thought. But don't let fear of losing him put you in a position of having kids you don't want just to keep him because that's a good way to create a life that you hate. OP. I know what you're saying. It makes sense. But it hurts me so much to think about that right now. I know I need to just take some time to pass and think about it when I'm hopefully not as emotional. It's just so crazy that less than 24 hours ago, I thought everything was great and that we would spend the rest of our lives together. And now it's like this. It's hard to be rational about it. So you break up. Don't have a baby with him to keep him. That's the stupidest thing you can do. You'll be miserable. Any willing thoughts of having one right now are nothing but panic bonding. Happened to me when my ex dumped me because she wants kids. I came to my senses pretty quickly and still don't want a kid. Breaking up will suck, but you'll get over it. Should I, 34 female, break up with my boyfriend, 58 male, of 10 years, because he's broke? I know, I know, another age gap relationship. So just to preface, I'll say that there is nothing inherently wrong with our relationship. There's no financial, emotional, or any type of mistreatment. We've only fought a few times, and generally are two very well-keeled and stable people. I would say my biggest sorrow is not being of a closer age to him. I love this man. He's incredibly funny and makes me laugh every day. He's an amazing cook. He's a gentleman. There's a lot of great things to say about him and very little bad. However, I'm not sure if this is the correct path to go for myself. For context, we both make six figures and I'm moderately successful in my career and I make 60,000 more than him with upwards trajectory. If he wishes to, he can earn as much as myself easily. But at his age, he doesn't have any ambition anymore, which is understandable. It's a long story. But he spends most, and I mean taking our personal loans and borrowing from me, he still owes me in fact, of his money on his unemployed brother. He also has a nephew in high school, and I'm very sure he will spend money on him too as the nephew enters college. I don't see this stopping anytime soon. He shuts me down every time I talk to him about this, so I don't. I'm just afraid of what's going to happen if I stay with him. He doesn't have any retirement funds nor savings. He doesn't have property in his name. Technically, he has nothing in his name besides his stable job. I love him, but I'm frustrated and afraid. What happens in seven years when he retires? I'm unwilling to subsidize our current lifestyle with my wages alone. There's no chance of us ever building anything together, such as owning a property together, just because he's bleeding money not on us. All I want is to own my own home, but I'm working towards that goal alone, and it's lonely. I feel like I should leave while I'm still relatively young and free myself in being able to find a true life partner. 
But how do you do that after 10 years together? And is leaving someone shallow just because I want a financially equal partner that I can build a life with? I'm lost. I welcome any advice. So he makes six figures but borrows endless money and has never saved anything? He's not broke because he has a high paying job, but he's 58 with absolutely zero personal finance skill whatsoever. That's a problem. He refuses to talk about this with you. That's a problem. Plenty of people support family and also look after themselves and their partner. You're not a priority. That's the problem. It's not shallow to want a partner who will communicate properly with you and who wants to work together to share financial goals. That's like two of the most important, boring parts of a healthy relationship. What would he do if he wasn't dating you? Would he be going into appalling levels of debt and bankrupt himself for the sake of his extended family? If nothing else, stop lending him money and let him do that. Tell him flat out that his financial attitude means that there's very little future for you both and you're not going to subsidize his bad decisions at great personal cost to yourself. If he chooses to drown himself in debt, at least he won't take you down with him. If you don't want to support this man in his retirement, and likely his brother as well to some degree, then this relationship has an expiration date. You're not dumping him because he's broke. You're dumping him because he never valued planning or security in his future. You're dumping someone who nearly hit 60 without any real plan and has consistently lived beyond his already pretty solid means. You're dumping him because he's an adult who refuses to discuss these serious issues with his partner of 10 years, which means he's not really your partner. And you know he has accepted already, on some level, that his care will be your job. His actions say he thinks that's okay. He either expects that of you, or he's dumping it on you without even thinking about you. My daughter is demanding to go vegan. My wife and I have eight kids between us. I know it's a lot, no need to comment on it. This post is mostly about our 13-year-old, Gina. Gina came to me recently and said that she wants to be vegan. I told her I'll pay for groceries, but she'll have to plan and cook her meals. She can't live off frozen food or takeout, and her mom and I will be making sure that her meals are healthy before taking her grocery shopping. She was not thrilled. She asked if we could make a small change to our diet to accommodate her, like switching to vegan pasta and cooking the meatballs separately. But we said no, because we aren't going to change our food and eating habits because she wants to be vegan. She said okay and went to her room. Then she started sending me and my wife links to expensive pots and pan sets. One set was $800, plates, cups, and bowls for $200, and her own utensils. I asked her why she was sending this to me, and she said that she needs new pots and pans and plates, etc., because ours are contaminated. I told her ours are perfectly fine, and if she wants her own, she can buy them with her allowance and start babysitting. Later that day, I got a call from one of my sons saying that Gina was telling him and my other kids that they have to get all of their snacks out of the fridge in the game room. The game room has a kitchenette because she needs it for her vegan food. When I called and asked what she was doing, she said her vegan food can't be in the same fridge as our food and it's not fair to make her go all the way to the garage when she's hungry, so she thought taking over the game room kitchenette would be a good compromise. I told Gina I'm done with all the vegan BS and that she can't be vegan while living in my house. She threw a temper tantrum because she thinks I'm being cruel and she's barely spoken to me since then. So I wanted to know if I was the jerk. Not the jerk, but this issue is a lot more complicated. It's not about being a vegan. I have a 13 year old daughter. At this age, kids feel like they have zero control over their lives. They're desperately trying to find a way they can assert control. Let's also call a spade a spade. 13 year old girls are emotional roller coasters. May I suggest you and your wife have a heart to heart with her? Understand why this is important to her. Don't dismiss her feelings. After you've let her explain her position, calmly reiterate your family's limits and abilities to accommodate her food choices. This situation needs to be handled with communication. Nothing good ever comes from dismissing a teenager. Yeah, I wonder how much of Gina's demands are in part because she's lost in the shuffle of her new large family. And if OP's family is like many other big families I've met, there's probably a fair amount of domestic and childcare duties that are dumped onto her. I know that he doesn't want us to comment on it, but eight kids is a lot. Kids can feel lost in the shuffle with half that number, so I can only imagine eight. OP also mentions in another comment that they have one kid with a shellfish allergy, so there's no shellfish in the house at all, and another kid with severe medical issues whose diet is monitored and the family eats food that is okay for the kid. I wonder if this whole vegan thing is an attempt to get attention and consideration that she feels like she's not getting. 
I grew up with three siblings, one with a medical issue. And even though my parents were very attentive and present, sometimes I felt lost in the shuffle. I can't imagine what the girl must be going through. Being 13 is hard enough, but not feeling important in your own family must really suck. Telling her to make her own food makes perfect sense, but the family can still help accommodate her by making simple adjustments, like cooking the meatball separately. Maybe they can compromise by starting with a vegetarian diet instead. That would probably be an easier transition for everyone, and then she can move to veganism as she gets older. You're the jerk for so many reasons. 1. Having 10 kids? I'm personally child-free, and I don't think anyone should be having kids with the current issues our world is facing. The fact that you have 10 shows how extremely selfish you are. 2. Your daughter wants to become vegan to make a positive change in the world, something you and your wife have no consideration of whatsoever. And instead of supporting her, you just inflict your outdated way of living onto her. I hope she goes no contact with you and finds friends who will support her in her journey to heal Mother Earth. And I hope you and your wife stop bringing kids into the world that you clearly aren't fit to raise. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or their daughter? Please let us know. I can't help but wonder if Reddit might not be the best place to seek parenting advice. Am I the jerk for not allowing my daughter to contact her biological parents? I, 40 female, and my husband, 42, have a daughter who's 9. She was adopted when she was born by myself and my husband, and she knows that she's adopted. Her biological mom was a very sweet 17-year-old who wanted to give her the best life she could. I don't know if her father ever even knew she was born. Recently, she had a school project where she was supposed to write about where she comes from. She's determined to find her biological mother and father to find out. I offered for her to write about our family instead. My husband and I don't want her reaching out to them. We told her this and she's upset, saying that we don't understand and she'll always wonder about them. She said we're being selfish and keeping her from finding out who she is. We obviously just want what's best for her. Am I the jerk? Commonly asked questions. The adoption was closed per my husband and I's request. The birth mother did give us her contact information in case our daughter ever wanted to find her. She does have a letter from her birth mother explaining why she was adopted and that it wasn't because she didn't love her. Update. I took some people's advice and called the phone number I have. To my surprise, she returned my voicemail. So I did get her age wrong. She was 18 when we adopted our daughter and is now 28, not married and no additional kids. She did confirm the biological father does not know my daughter was born. I let her know why I was calling, but I truly did not want them to have communication. I explained my reasoning and that we're her parents and are only doing what we think is best. She let me know that when my daughter and I are ready, she'll be there to answer any questions. I should also add her biological mother did offer to do an interview by sending a video answering my daughter's questions or an email. Please, please, please reconsider this. Do some research. My little sister was adopted at birth in a similar situation, and I'm a foster and adoptive parent now. And I promise, if you don't let her meet her birth family when she's younger, she will create her own narrative about them. They won't be real. They will be saviors or demons, and that will follow her into adulthood. Several questions about who she is, where her freckles came from, why she's allergic to cats. If she meets them now, much like a beloved but weird aunt, or a step-cousin who lives in the basement, or a best friend you adore but still see as human, she can accept them as real people, like all of us, with great attributes and maybe serious flaws. Even if she struggles, you have years left to process and be there for her and help her through it. That is not necessarily the case if your lack of support makes her take this journey as an adult or otherwise without you. Please evaluate whether saying no is really born out of your fears and anxiety. <coughs> and kindly, maybe a self-centered choice. You may worry that her birth mother is younger, prettier, funnier, that they will instantly connect, that you will be replaced. But you have to know that the bond you've grown over these past nine years is not replaceable, right? She will still love you. You are still mom and dad, and if she finds someone else to love and be loved by in this world, that's what we all want for our kids. Life is better the more people that love you. Please also look into some adoption communities. Adoption kids are so much more at risk of serious mental health issues and a lot of that is these unanswered questions, this burden of never knowing their original families. Read The Primal Wound. Read studies on adoptee well-being. You would absolutely be putting her emotional and psychological health at risk by refusing her these connections. And if you do refuse, what's the upside for you here? She does it in secret online through Facebook research and forums and forms a relationship without you even knowing? 
I mean, she can just do a DNA test as a teenager and she'll probably get some hits and you'll never know. Maybe she even waits till 18. But now she knows your insecurity and finding her biological family isn't something she shares with you, either for your sake or hers. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk for not wanting their daughter to meet her biological mom or not? Please let us know. My wife keeps throwing away perfectly good leftovers and I'm sick of it. I, 33 male, started a fight with my wife who's 30 over her habit of wasting food. We come from very different backgrounds when it comes to food. Her family had the financial means to go out to eat frequently, often cooking large meals that could feed an army. In their household, the rule was that whoever got to the leftovers first could have them. On the other hand, my family was more frugal, only dining out on special occasions and cooking just enough for one or two meals. Takeout was never shared, and if we had leftovers, they were distributed equally. The disparity in our upbringings has caused significant disagreements in our marriage. My wife is the primary cook, and she tends to order takeout frequently because we both have demanding jobs. Throughout our 10-year relationship, she has learned to cook smaller portions to prevent food from spoiling. She doesn't really enjoy eating leftovers, as the smell of cold food often makes her feel sick. As a result, she tries to meal prep or cook just enough for two meals at most, knowing that wasting food bothers me. Whenever we have leftovers, I always inform her when her portion is still in the fridge. Usually she tells me to just help myself if I want more. She has previously mentioned that if she genuinely plans to eat it later, she would write her name on the container or tell me not to eat it. However, to the best of my recollection, she has never done that. I always tell her that the leftovers are hers so she can have them and we go back and forth like this for several rounds. The other night we had leftover Chinese takeout, her portion as I had finished mine. When she asked me what I wanted her to cook for dinner, I reminded her about her leftovers. She casually replied, oh yeah, hand it here. Surprisingly, she emptied the entire container into the trash without even looking at it. In shock, I asked her, what are you doing? She then explained that she had devised a new system. If she tells me three times that I can eat her leftovers because she doesn't intend to have them, she will discard them before they spoil. According to her, this was the fourth time I had reminded her about the leftovers, which triggered the disposal. I fell silent, trying to process the fact that she made this decision without discussing it with me. Eventually, I told her that she could have informed me that she was going to throw them away and I would have eaten them. She firmly believes that the statute of limitations had expired since she had already told me three times that I could have them and she believed that she had the right to do as she pleased with them. If I had known she was going to throw them away instead of eating them herself, I would have eaten them, as I genuinely didn't mind her having them. I just feel like she hasn't truly listened to or disregarded my feelings and upbringing regarding food. Since then, I've told her to do as she pleases, and we haven't really talked since. So, am I the jerk? You're the jerk. Your wife has made her position on leftovers very clear, and you don't seem to be able to adapt to that. Let me recap. First, she basically gave you a free pass to eat her leftovers whenever you want because she, by default, doesn't want them. You weren't comfortable with that setup, though it doesn't sound like there was ever a situation where you ate her leftovers and she got mad about it. So you keep reminding her about the leftovers that she has basically said she doesn't want. She got sick of this and threw out the food. I understand that that's wasteful and upsetting to you, but you were driving her crazy and she snapped. She's also now given you clear expectations for the new system so that you both don't have to keep getting upset over this all the time. Also, just to cement you being the jerk, you say, if I had known she had tossed them instead of eating them, I truly would have eaten them myself. You're the jerk. You need to seek therapy. I also grew up in a really poverty-struck family. We were homeless multiple times on state assistance, went to food banks, you name it, we did it. I also cannot stand leftovers because of this. Unless I purposely buy something I know I'm going to eat as leftovers or that I'm meal prepping, I cannot do it. I'm steady, but I'm not well off, so I'm super careful, but admit I do toss more food than I care to admit. The reason I vote this way is because if you remind her three times and she tells you each time to eat it and you then continue to just remind her, it feels more like you're shaming her and instead of eating them first, second, or third time she told you to, then yeah, I don't blame her for tossing it. She's also your wife, not your kid. She doesn't need your permission to do anything. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his wife? Please let us know. Today I learned that some people don't eat leftovers. I'm just not sure what this world's coming to anymore. First world problems, Karen. First world problems. I keep meeting my birth mom, but she doesn't know it's me. She had me when she was 14, 
and I, 24, male, was given up for adoption. My parents told me about her growing up. I still have the letter she wrote me, and then she asked if they could give it to me. It's crazy reading it sometimes and knowing it was a literal kid who wrote it, saying she's sorry that she couldn't be my mommy, but she hopes I'm okay. She was open to having contact, but we moved from my dad's job when I was 11, and then it seemed impossible to find her. But luckily, I did. She's working at this small restaurant, and I keep going, but she doesn't know it's me. We talk sometimes, and she seems like a nice lady. Sometimes when she says something like, Do you want a refill, honey? Or uses another term like that, I want to tell her. I don't know why it makes me nervous. We talk sometimes, and she seems really genuine. If it's not super busy, she's more open to talking about random stuff. I literally drive two hours to come eat at this place just to see her, and it's like she knows me already because I'm there once or two times a week for the past three months, so she always says hi with a big smile. But man, if she only knew. Update. Well, I did it. I told her. And yeah, it was pretty heavy. My heart was even beating fast. I kept trying to think how to tell her. Many of the commenters on my last post here mentioned writing her a letter just how she wrote a letter for me. Originally, that was the plan, but for me, it felt like I needed to say it. Oh, really quick, I want to say thanks to everyone for your love and support, mostly to all the birth parents out there who shared their stories with me. That's what really helped me push to have the courage to confront her. It meant so much, so thanks. Everything happened the day before yesterday, by the way. I did wait for her to be done with her shift, and that was when they were closing the restaurant already and waiting in the parking lot. We said hi when she saw me first, but then I told her there was something serious that she needed to know. First, I told her sorry for keeping it from her this long. She didn't react until I actually pulled out her letter, and she started bawling from here, like screaming and crying at the same time, and I didn't even have to finish the whole I'm your son speech. She just saw it and knew. It was crazy. Next thing I know, she's hugging me instantly, but then she pulled back and asked if it's okay to hug me. Of course it is, and we're just there hugging each other and crying in the parking lot. It hit her hard though. Her legs gave out for a second, so I had to actually hold her up while she's still hugging me for a minute. What really got me was her saying to look at how big I got. Also hearing her cry made me cry too. She went back to open the restaurant up. She wouldn't take no for an answer. We had coffee, ate a slice of their pie, and talked. So much stuff that we talked about. She told me the second time I came to the restaurant, she got a feeling but for her it was hard to believe it was me. So that feeling she had was pushed way down. Because she told me for years after I was adopted, she saw kids that would be my age and used to think they were me. Then she would be crying in public. It really messed with her mind a lot and made her depressed, so she didn't want to do the same when she saw me, getting her hopes up like that. She says I look so much like my biological dad when he was younger though. We talked about him too. They stayed in contact with each other in case I ever reached out to one of them so it would be easier to contact the other. I didn't have hope about finding my biological dad since he was never mentioned, so I'm glad they both planned for the future scenario. She told me about how they wanted to keep me, especially my biological dad. He didn't want me to be adopted, but he knew they had to because they were just kids. It took him a long time to get over it is what she told me. That's why he didn't leave anything, because he didn't want to believe he might not see me again. We talked for hours until almost 2 in the morning. They closed at 11. She just wanted to know everything about me, but her main thing was, am I happy? Were my parents good to me? Did I have a happy childhood? And I did. I told her thank you for helping to give me this life. We both cried again. She cried the most. Everything was emotional for her. Sometimes she would look really happy, but then get sad again. After my 18th birthday, she was hoping I would find her. That's why she stayed in the same city. But since I didn't, she always thought maybe I resented her, wasn't told that I had been adopted, or maybe had decided it was better not to have her around. It made me feel bad for not telling her sooner. She told me it's not my fault, and I did right going at my own pace. Honestly, she's so sweet. The way she kept looking at me with the biggest smile, it made me emotional sometimes. Makes you think, how can someone who's been a total stranger your whole life look at you with so much love? It's wild. We learned so much about each other. She asked me if we could have dinner soon to keep talking. And if at some point in the future, if I'm interested to come over to her house so I can meet her husband. That all sounded really great. We exchanged numbers. After I left, she sent me a text telling me thank you for giving her this gift that she didn't even know if it would ever come. My girlfriend came over and she hugged me while I cried. I wasn't sad by the way. These were happy tears. Everything went better than I expected. There was still emotionally heavy stuff, but I'm still glad that we get to open up to each other. Update 
Lots of you asked to let you know how it goes meeting my biological dad, and to say it was emotional is an understatement. I'd been feeling so many things since this all happened. We met up a few days ago. Was originally supposed to be almost two weeks ago, but things kept coming up. Work, then I got sick for days, but we made it happen. To be honest, this was more nervous for me because I didn't know anything about him. With my biological mom, it was different because I watched her from far and got to know her a little before it came out. I asked my biological mom if she could be there too, just because she knows him better, so it was the two of us waiting for him at this park. He was already crying before we even got to him. This guy is strong too, so he pulled me in for the biggest bear hug and crying. He told me he wants me to know that they loved me so much and he loves me. I lost count how many times he'd come back in for one more hug. This definitely got to him and he kept saying, thank you God, a few times. Looking at my face, the feelings, man, the feelings. We had so many of them. Hearing him tell me how much they love me, even back then. It meant so much for me to hear that, and not gonna lie, that had me holding him tight too. I'm sure everyone at the park thought it was weird seeing three people crying together. My biological dad said he cried so many times just driving over here, he didn't think he had any more tears until he saw us. When we were all sitting down, it hit me that my biological mom was not lying when she said we look alike. Obviously he's older, but still, wow, the similarities. He brought gifts too, which was a surprise. It was really nice. He told me I don't have to keep them if I don't want it, but he felt weird not coming with anything, and he's wanted to give this to me for a long time. One was a teddy bear holding a picture frame of him at the hospital holding me. He was 15 years old, it's still crazy to realize that. And then the other thing was a journal. The journal was stuff he said he started writing to me years after I was adopted. He was in therapy and that that helped him to cope, thinking he would give them to me one day. His way of still feeling connected to me. I haven't read anything yet, but some of the pages were his thoughts and like if he's talking to me. How he felt when they found out she was pregnant, then the adoption, everything going on in his mind when he first got to hold me as a baby. I didn't even know he was at the hospital too. It was not what I was expecting. It really got me. I read some more of what he wrote last night that really got me crying. I'm sad to think how much this affected them emotionally for years. Also, I think it's pretty sweet he wanted to write this for me. We talked about his own life, which was pretty hard, his struggles with home life, and the feelings he had about giving me up. Then he wanted to know everything about me, basically with the same questions my biological mom had. I made sure they knew they made the right decision, because my life was pretty great. He looked like he wanted to cry when he knew that, because that's all they had hoped for, and it was something he always wondered about for years. My biological mom left a bit after we were more comfortable, so we could talk more in private, and so it didn't feel too awkward between us. From there, he told me stories about how he met my biological mom. Sometimes he'd point out stuff he had noticed about me that reminds him of her, or that we have similar likes. Example, I love eating mangoes. I can eat them all day, and that's what I bought when we bought snacks at the park. He told me my biological mom was obsessed with mangoes, even before she got pregnant, and while pregnant, she craved them even more. Just cool info to know, even if it's random stuff. It's still stuff we have in common, and we both have lots. We both like hiking, playing pool. He was a swimmer in college, and I was on a swim team in high school. We both love rock music, especially 90s. My biological dad was really open about sharing everything, like he really was getting ready for this meeting. He hoped it would happen, and he prayed every day to see me again because he had so many things he wanted to tell me. Overall, really good first meeting. I'm glad it went well. He's open to the idea of meeting my parents. After I told them about all this, because they definitely want to meet my biological parents again if I'm comfortable with that. Obviously, if my biological parents are too. Let's see what happens. I don't know how it's going to feel for me. They met each other before, before I was ever even born. But I never had them at the same place, so that'll be interesting. Me and my parents met up yesterday to have breakfast so I could tell them everything. My mom was so happy how it went. She actually cried too when I was telling them about both of their reactions. My dad was proud because he knew how hard it was the months after finding my biological mom and not really wanting to make contact yet. I'm really happy to have their support because it's hard not to feel guilty about wanting to know more about my biological parents. They gave me a really good life, so for a while it's felt like maybe to them I'm showing them that it wasn't good enough for me and I'd rather have my biological parents. But they told me many times that they want me to do this for me and they know how much I love them, and I really do. Finding them and meeting them was hard, but it was so worth it to me, and seeing their reactions made it feel even more worth it. Still can't believe it sometimes. 
Is it just me or is somebody cutting onions in here? Oi. I'm leaving my wife tomorrow and I couldn't be happier. I'm 45 male and my wife, 44 female, have been married for 10 years. We dated for six before that and I got a lot of pressure to get married from my parents, her parents, her. Something in my gut said that this wasn't right. I called it cold feet and did my best to ignore it. We got married. Pretty much the moment the ink was dry on her marriage license, things went south. On our honeymoon, she did nothing but complain I hadn't booked a nicer hotel. In the following months, she wanted a new apartment, a new car, gifts, jewelry, handbags. It was never enough. It's like the moment she got the ring, it stopped being about me and became about what I could give her. I'm a doctor. I make good money. Not good enough to support the kind of lifestyle she wants, though. We don't hook up anymore. We don't laugh. We don't talk about anything but money. We have no kids. She said she wanted them before marriage, then changed her mind. Our home looks like a showroom. There's no warmth or joy or even comfort here. I hate it. I can't stand her. I'm a 45-year-old physician and I have barely enough savings to sustain us for three months. I want to retire someday. I want to enjoy my life. I rented a cool apartment across town in a less desirable neighborhood and there's a stack of Ikea furniture waiting for me to set it up there. The lease is up on the Mercedes my wife pushed me to lease next month and I will be replacing it with a used Prius. I'm starting therapy next week. I have a divorce attorney who has assured me that the prenup we signed before marriage means I won't have to pay alimony. I hope to leave the higher paying job that my wife insisted I take for something with less hours sometime in the next year. I'm going to ask out the pretty barista who flirts with me every morning. I'm telling her first thing tomorrow. I'm expecting her to cry and beg and demand we try therapy. I don't want any of that. This was never right and I'm only sorry it took me so long to realize it. I'm sorry I've wasted so much of my life being married to a woman because I thought it was the right thing. I'm so excited. Update. First of all, wow, I didn't expect this post to blow up. I really was getting it off my chest and expected a few good luck comments and not much more. I know a lot of people were asking for an update, so here it goes. Usually when I wake up, I go for a run or a bike ride. While I'm gone, my wife gets up, gets dressed, gets a smoothie going, whatever. This morning, I paced the kitchen, rehearsing what I had to tell her over and over again. When she finally came down, I felt oddly calm. I wasn't expecting to be panicked exactly, but apprehensive at least. I told her I needed to speak with her. She gave me an, uh-huh, and didn't look up from the coffee machine. Then I just came out with it. I told her I was leaving and that I wanted a divorce. That we hadn't been happy in a long time and I felt as though she didn't care about me or my emotional needs. Pretty much instantly the gaslighting began. She cried that I never get her flowers anymore, that I don't do enough to support her, that I don't care if she's happy. I brought up the fact that I suggested therapy over a year ago and she agreed, but then made excuse after excuse not to go. I brought up the time she completely ignored the budget we worked on. I told her how it made me feel when she dismissed me when I tried to tell her how I was feeling. The crying escalated then, along with begging for a chance to make this right, to go to therapy, that she would be better. It went like I thought it would go, and I felt absolutely nothing. I don't care anymore. Whatever I once felt for her is just gone, and she might as well have been a second cousin sobbing about her marriage for all the connection I felt to it. Eventually, I just got fed up and walked out. She's been blowing up my phone with calls and texts, which range from angry to begging to threatening. I started getting calls from her mother and mine too, by the end of the day. I spoke briefly to my mother and calmly explained that I was sorry she didn't hear it from me, but my wife was ruining me financially and emotionally and I couldn't do it anymore. She was surprisingly supportive. I'm currently in my new apartment. I unrolled the mattress in a box and went to Walmart for my sheets. I ate Thai takeout for dinner at the kitchen counter and watched a bit of Netflix on my computer. I have everything I need for the next few days. My wife is getting served tomorrow. I keep expecting the sadness to set in, but it hasn't. I feel like a thousand pounds are off my shoulders and suddenly my future is full of possibilities. I'm going to travel. I'm going to try new restaurants. I'm going to take a job that actually makes me happy and that I'm proud of instead of being rich. Much to the internet's chagrin, I will ask out the barista because despite unpopular opinion, she's both age appropriate, it's her family's business, and I do have the interpersonal skills to recognize the difference between customer service and actual connection. Cheers, everyone. I'm going to have a beer and then take a walk around my new neighborhood. All right, folks. I've gotten a lot of comments begging me to not ask out the barista as it's her job to be nice to me. I didn't really get into the relationship I have with her because I didn't think it was relevant to the divorce. But here goes. 
I met her about a year ago. She's 30. I don't usually wear a wedding ring because my job requires me to scrub regularly. She actually asked me out, invited me to a food truck festival in town a few months into knowing each other. I said I was married and she was embarrassed. Since then, we've had a bit of a running joke where she asks me, so, still married? My current plan is to reply, not for long, and see what happens. I appreciate the internet's apprehension. In truth, I would probably say the same thing if I didn't know the backstory. But I promise, I'm not a creep. You want to know where I'm at at all times? Your wish is my command. This happened about eight years ago, just one year into my first job and paid internship and clerking gig. I don't know what to call it. The firm that I worked for had a part-time program for law students so they could work and gain experience while in school. Very common in my country. I loved my job. I was very grateful for the opportunity to learn and grow, and I really enjoyed the work I performed. The thing was, I had classes both in the morning and the afternoon and at night, and my school was at a different side of the city, about 8 miles away, that could turn into hours of traffic during rush hour in a city with 8 million inhabitants. So my days looked pretty hectic, as something like this. 5.30 to 7, get ready and drive to school. 7 to 9, class. 9 to 10, drive to work. 10 to 1700, work. 1700 to 1800, drive to school, 1800 to 2200, classes. Then I would try to study for one hour after class, and I would often eat while driving. During my first year in the program, I had more than proved myself and earned my place. I was that 19 to 20 year old idiot, type A overachiever that knew no boundaries. I had worked weekends, pulled all-nighters, literally I would leave school at 10 p.m., go back to work, worked full-time in the summers without more pay, anything I had to do to keep the associates happy so they'd keep teaching me. As I was wrapping up my first anniversary there, the perfect storm of awful rolled around. On the academic front, I started a new semester and twice a week in the mornings I had a teacher who was awesome but would finish class 20 to 30 minutes late. On the work front, a new partner joined the firm, let's call him Mr. Jerk, Jerk for short, and kind of took over as unofficial managing partner. He was the typical old-fashioned lawyer that should be extinct by now. He could barely use Microsoft Word to type a contract and would pass out at the sight of an Excel sheet. He had this weird obsession with punctuality while simultaneously being late to everything. Plus, he moronically believed that by having a bunch of people warming up chairs, he would magically make money. So instead of investing time on client development, he would just spend endless time and effort on bullying everyone around the office. To make matters worse, since other people spoke highly of me, he decided to pay special attention to me. Unsurprisingly, shortly after Jerk joined, the firm started struggling. Now, he could have tried to get new clients, send quotes by the deadline, and show up to meetings on time. But no. Of course the firm was doing poorly because us clerks did not spend enough time warming up the chairs. So he became obsessed with us getting there by 10 a.m., especially me. The issue was that I could not get there by 10 because my teacher finished class late and there was no way I could drive across the city in rush hour in 30 minutes. So, Jerk called a meeting with all the clerks and yelled at me in front of everyone because I was always late. More like two times a week, but whatever. The fact that I'd gotten permission from the program committee did not matter. The fact that I was working six or seven hours every day while I only had to work five did not matter. The fact that I would work weekends and late nights did not matter. I tried to explain, but he kept yelling at me and would not let me talk. Having had enough, I left the conference room straight into the office of every member of the clerk program committee, one junior associate, one senior associate, and one partner, to say the same speech. I'm late because I have class. I've proven my commitment to the firm, but my education is important too. If 30 minutes late twice a week is too big of an issue, feel free to fire me, but I'm not leaving my class early. Then I went to my desk to do my work. I guess the committee informed other partners and word got around of what was going on, small firm because as I was getting ready to leave for school, Jerk came fuming to my desk and told me, I know you're lying. From now on, I want to know where you are at at all times, and if I catch that you were slacking off or lying, you're fired, and I will make sure no one will ever hire you. So, cue malicious compliance. The next day I woke up extra early, 5 a.m. sharp, took a time-stamped photo and sent it both to his email and phone, since I couldn't risk him not getting it and not knowing where I was at. I sent a time-stamped photo every five minutes captioning what I was doing like it was my own personal social media platform of one follower. The cherry on top was that my teacher had worked with Jerk in the past and obviously did not like him very much, so he let me take photos during class and diligently sent them to Jerk. 
I even went so far as taking a photo of the toilet door with the text, going to the bathroom, and then a flushing the toilet. All done. While driving, since traffic was really slow, I would send a photo and include how much I had moved during that time. Sometimes it was something absurd like 100 feet. As soon as I sent a photo of me at my desk, he shows up saying that he got the point and I could stop. A couple weeks later, he simply stopped bugging people and started working from home or locking himself up in his office. My guess is I was not the only one to complain and the other partner realized how dangerous he could be for the firm and asked him to back off. Random lady thinks my hearing aids are AirPods. Oh my gosh, I have one. Never did think I'd have a story for this sub. Wow, okay, I'm still in a state of rage. So I just got home from good old Mart of Walls. I knew pretty much what I wanted, so I didn't bother with a cart. Of course, I get distracted, and I end up in the kitchen cutlery aisles, and I'm idly looking at things and putting them back on the shelves. I guess that made me look like a worker? I don't know how. I'm wearing a dress. Whatever. So I'm hard of hearing. I wear hearing aids. They're rose gold and awesome. Cool tech in my ears. Since I'm shopping, I have no reason to think someone would be needing my attention, but this entitled mom was trying to get my attention. I see this woman and she says, Finally, I've been chasing you down the aisles. I'm thinking I must have something loose or I drop something. That she thought I was a worker just did not occur to me. You really shouldn't wear those things while you're working. She's out of breath. Her little toddler is babbling away, oblivious. I'm still clueless. Wear what? The AirPods! Fun fact, as someone who is hard of hearing, I mishear things and it took me forever to understand what she said. I thought she said, their pods. Whose pods? Your pods. What pods? I'm looking down at my dress, thinking something had latched onto my dress. As I put my head down, this crazy Karen grabbed my left hearing aid. It's squealing away and protesting, and I'm in such a state of shock. My aids are a part of me. I went from baffled to pure rage in a split second. You give that back now. I clawed at my hearing aid, and I wrestled it back from her. I'm trembling at this point. Don't touch me. Entitled mom's kid starts crying from the sudden energy change. Look what you did. I was just saying you shouldn't wear those while you're working. I start walking away from her. Get away from me. If you come near me, I'll call the police and have you arrested for assault. What? Assault? But I growled at her. Yes, growled and I walked away to find a store manager to tell them they had a customer who just tried taking one of my hearing aids. But then I left. I was too outraged to get back to my lackadaisical meandering. Charged me an extra month and don't want to return my deposit? The contract of the apartment I've been living in for the past year recently ended. I had, however, forgotten of the 60 days written move-out notice until I was reminded by management 10 days before I turned in my notice. Though it is specified in the contract and it is my responsibility as a tenant to maintain them, I was still livid by the fact that they didn't have the courtesy to remind me all the three times they contacted me about renewing my contract and me verbally declining. All three times they said they had taken note of it and me being the fool that I am, I believed them. Since I did not provide the 60 days notice before moving out and writing, I was forced to pay an extra month of rent that regardless of my moaning and crying was not waived. Throughout my panic, they kept reminding me that it was in the contract and that they couldn't do anything. Since I had to pay an extra month, I decided I was going to do everything in my power to get my deposit back, cueing the malicious compliance. I went through the entire contract. The contract specified that I was allowed to be present during the inspection as long as I provided a written notice in advance, no date specified, and that I had the right to any information extracted from the inspection. The contract also specified that the apartment has to be left in the same condition it was received and that I was responsible for any cleaning fees from services they'd have to use. Before I actually start the juicy part of the story, I have to mention that I took detailed pictures and videos of the apartment when I moved in. Unfortunately, mine was incredibly dirty, even food in the carpets. I requested it to be cleaned, but they never came by and did anything, so I took care of it since I'm terrified of confrontation but I still saved and recorded everything that was not okay regardless of how mild it was. The day I read the contract, I emailed them requesting to be present during the inspection and that I wanted a copy of everything obtained from that inspection to compare with my notes. They didn't respond that day, so I took it upon myself to email them every day for the next four days until they got back to me with the following reply. Per the rental agreement move-out inspection, 
You may be present at move-out inspection if you notify us in advance in writing of your request. OP, you turned your keys into the drop box on 53022 and never requested a walkthrough. The walkthrough inspection was already completed this morning. So, I obviously forwarded all my previous emails asking if those were not considered in writing. Then they offered to redo the inspection with me present, but I was out of town, so I requested all the data they obtained from it instead to which they agreed. To this day, I have not received anything from the inspection, but I did find out that they didn't actually do it until three days after they started. They did on that email via the bill they sent charging me cleaning fees and no deposit back. I was like, okay, since you're not going to send me what I asked for, I'm going to send you what I have. I highlighted the part where they lied to me about the inspection date, attached pictures of how I received the apartment compared to how I left it, very clean, and I made sure to include their timestamps. Advised that, per the contract, there is no reason for them to charge me cleaning fees since it was in better condition than received. I also demanded my deposit back and sent them receipts of all products I used to clean the apartment, including a new vacuum, so they could refund me at their earliest convenience or I'd contact corporate directly. I also advised that I'd send them all the communication we had ever had, the lies they told me, and the rest of the video and images I have of the apartment. I honestly have no idea if I would have gotten anywhere contacting corporate, but it doesn't matter because within three days I got my deposit back and got refunded for everything I spent on cleaning supplies. I did leave a review in every site I could find, but the Google one got removed for some reason. Karen's sister-in-law demands to use my pool. My fiancé and I own a house with a pool in the backyard. His sister, who will call Karen, had asked the day before if she and her family, her husband and three kids, could come over on Sunday to swim after one of the kids' sports games, which was at a park close by to us. Now, fiancé and I, we own a small business together that requires work from home on Sundays. Everyone that we know is aware of this, including sister-in-law. I voiced my opinion that I felt it was weird for people to be at our house while we were working in the basement, but fiancé assured me that it would just be chill. He said it's normal for family to use each other's pools even if they aren't home. So we let them come over, thinking that they would be swimming for maybe an hour and then leave. But it wasn't just them. Fiancé's parents also came. We figured they would. But the kicker is that Karen also invited two of her friends, plus their partners and their kids as well. We do know these people, but both fiancé and I were not aware of this beforehand. So now it's a full-on party in our backyard while we're just working in the basement. I became very annoyed that they did not only invite themselves, but some of their friends as well. It made me feel guilty that I couldn't be in my own backyard to host people because I was working. It also felt like they were just using the house and didn't really care about seeing us, the homeowners. Not to mention, the house was a complete mess. We had a busy Friday and Saturday and I didn't bother cleaning much before because I figured it would just be Karen's family. Everyone was here from 1 p.m. until 7 p.m. We finished work around 3 p.m., at which point my fiancé put on his swimming trunks to join them outside. I got in a pretty bitter mood from it all and I just stayed inside. I didn't say hello to anyone because I figured they weren't even here to see me, just my pool. I did do some laundry and some cleaning up and I ended up seeing a few people who were coming inside to use the washroom. I said hi and tried to make some small talk, but I really wasn't happy. Fiancé came in and said that I was creating an awkward and unwelcoming atmosphere by not being outside. I told him I never planned to have a party today, so I was just carrying on doing what I had originally planned, which was laundry and cleaning. Fiancé keeps saying that I was rude for not joining them outside after work. He also says things like, the pool is meant to be used, and that it's family time. Am I the jerk? Edit. Answering those who have asked, we bought this house together completely 50-50. Not the jerk. You're not obligated to host a party you don't want with people you didn't invite. This is a fiancé problem. Not the jerk. Not the jerk, but you and your fiancé need to have a serious conversation about this. It's guaranteed not to be a one-time thing and you clearly have different expectations about your home life. I hope you're prepared for unexpected and unwanted guests for the rest of your life. Your fiancé clearly thinks your home is a community center and you clearly think it's a private place. Neither approach is wrong, but they are entirely incompatible. My fiancé's ex recently passed away and my relationship is now in shambles. My fiancé, 30 male, and I, 31 female, have been together for nearly three years. We were super excited for our wedding that's going to take place six months from now. 
I had a hard boundary against exes in the relationship, and we both agreed that no pictures, no contact, no stories, nothing. Prior to meeting me, he was in a serious relationship for about the same time as us. However, his ex, 29 female, one day told him that she no longer loved him and they broke up. He was heartbroken and it took him months to heal. Since his ex was blocked, her mom contacted my fiance and told him that she had cancer and wanted to meet him one last time. This was a difficult decision considering my boundaries, but I felt really sorry that this girl was going through this at such a young age, so I supported my fiance's decision to go see her, but on the condition that I would be in the same room as them. Apparently, she had developed skin cancer and the doctor had drawn up a prognosis for her a few months before they broke up. The ex told both of us that she wanted him to live a happy life with a woman who could share life with him and she wished us well. That's why she lied about not loving him anymore and that she always loved him this whole time. She recently passed three weeks ago and my fiancé is a mess now. I can't unsee the way they both held each other's hands and the look of nostalgia and love in his eyes for her. As I was looking on, I felt like an outsider. It's so difficult and hurtful to see him cry about another woman who he once loved. I literally can't unhear things he said to his mom in the kitchen one day. I wonder what life could have been like with her. We could have been a happy family of our own. She wanted kids with me, and we could have named her Rose like she wanted. Where does this leave me? Why am I in his life still if he'd rather be with someone else? I promised myself that I'll only ever be with a guy for whom I am his one and only and first priority. I saw that in him before, but now... I don't know. Trust me, I'm not a heartless person and I would rather not put myself in any position where I'll consider myself to be a monster. But this feels incredibly complicated and extremely hurtful to feel like a third wheel in my once happy and thriving relationship. He's been reaching out to me for support and I lent a listening ear and he's been telling me so many stories from his time with her and I didn't like any of it. My therapist told me while having empathy is important, I shouldn't have to lose myself in my relationship even if circumstances are hard. Two days ago, he received a package in the mail, and it was from the ex's sister. Apparently, it was a photo album from their old times together that his ex wanted him to have. My fiancé held it so gently and teared up a little, and I literally broke down on the floor crying, having a panic attack. I think I almost unloaded all of what I've been feeling, the third wheel, the unfairness of the whole situation based on what my boundaries around exes had been, my anger at the ex for inserting herself in our lives for no good reason when both of us were literally so happy and how things were panning out regarding our wedding, questioning where his loyalties lie, and I think I did it in one of the most hurtful ways. I told him that we need to pause our wedding plans for now and wanted a week or two off to think about our relationship. I'm at my sister's place and haven't been able to sleep or eat properly ever since. It's almost as if I'm falling out of love with my fiancé and he's been calling me and texting me non-stop. I feel so guilty right now. He was in a horrible place a few years ago, and I'm afraid I might be triggering that again. He says his ex has already passed and it's gonna break him if I leave him too. If I leave him too? Emphasis on the two. I'm just done. What the heck am I supposed to do? Well, this is wildly complicated. On one hand, I think he's in mourning for not only this person, but also the relationship he thought they had. He mourned the relationship of someone who didn't love him and I don't wanna be that person, but you know he loved her. So her admission shifted things. On the other hand, I can understand your feelings. You're not a replacement for this woman and you shouldn't be made to feel that way. I do think that once he's grieved all of the individual things, assessing things will be easier. But there should also be acknowledgement that like things said in anger, things said in grief also cannot be undone. If there is not anything he can do to truly undo the image you now have, then you need to be honest with yourself about that. I'm truly so sorry for you both. I think you're both experiencing grief for answers tied to someone no longer around. Please be gentle with yourself because you don't sound like a monster. You sound like someone trying to support their partner through an issue that triggers things within you as well. Everyone's feelings here are valid. There's no monstrosity in that. For sure, pause the wedding. He's grieving her. I don't think you should break up with him, but pause the wedding and see how you feel in a month or two. I'm sorry. It's kind of contradictory for her to break up with him so he could find happiness with someone else only to confront him later with the truth, which sends his mind in a tailspin and essentially damages his current relationship with the woman he was supposed to be happy with. That's messed up. I know he's grieving right now, but hopefully he will realize how this situation looks from your perspective. You're feeling like a third wheel when you should be his number one priority. My best guy friend just told me he's in love with me 
Two days before my wedding, plus update. I've been with my fiance for three years, engaged for a little over a year. My best friend and I have known each other since freshman year of college. We're all in our early 30s. This morning, I woke up to a long text from my guy best friend that he had sent around 6 a.m. Basically, it was him pouring his heart out to me. He said he's been in love with me for years, but always hoped I'd end up breaking up with my fiance and finally noticing him. He asked me to call off the wedding and run away with him. It said, I needed to tell you before it was too late. I just feel gross and sad. I have no feelings for him beyond platonic love. I've drafted a response and deleted it over and over. I haven't even told my fiance. I don't want him to have to worry about me so soon to our wedding. I know I need to, but I don't know what to do or how to phrase it. What's worse is that he's become my fiance's friend too. I'm also pretty upset that my friend chose such an unfortunate time to cause me such distress. There were many times over the years that he could have just bucked up and told me how he felt, but waiting until right before I married? Like I would just cancel my wedding and leave my fiancé because of a text message? I want to tell him to not come to the wedding. I can't trust that he wouldn't try to pull something. I don't even know if I want to talk to him again, but the thought of losing my best friend is heartbreaking. Heck, the thought of not having him at my wedding is really painful. He's put me in an uncomfortable, impossible situation. I wish it wasn't on me to deal with his feelings for him. I wish he had either stopped being friends with me when he realized us ending up together would never happen or had told me a while ago. I don't want to kick him while he's down, but I need to make it clear that I have no feelings. The wedding is still on and I don't want him to attend. We've been friends for over a decade. I've been crying over this all day. I feel almost disgusted knowing that this whole time he had ulterior motives. How do I even go about dealing with this? I'm supposed to get married in under 48 hours. Edit. I'll be showing this text to my fiancé after he gets home from his brothers. I won't send anything until he's here with me. Update. My husband, I love being able to say that now, and I got back from our honeymoon yesterday. I turned on my phone and opened the Reddit app and it was still signed into this account, so I had an, oh yeah, moment and figured I'd post an update. So a lot of people here really helped validate the icky mess of feelings I was having. Thank you for that. So that night, my fiancé got home from his brother's. I let him sit down and then I showed him the text. He read it and I watched his eyes get bigger and expression angrier. Of course, I started apologizing like an idiot and he told me I didn't owe him an apology for anything. We talked and he told me he figured the guy had a crush but kept it respectful. And really, he had. We were close, but beyond a side hug during greetings and goodbyes, there was no physicality. I even let him read out past messages just to see that there was no emotional affair or me leading him on. I never even vented about my fiancé when we would have arguments because I knew better than to do that. I'd talk to my mom instead. So my fiancé asked me what I wanted to do, and I said that while it did sadden me, I didn't want him at our wedding. I was afraid that he would try something else. We typed up a very brief message. It said, Friend, I'm sorry that you mistook my friendship for something more. The wedding is going to happen, and it would be better if you didn't attend. To be clear, I let my fiancé read this message and he stands by my decision to uninvite you. We wanted to make it clear that it was me who wanted him not to come, not just my fiancé. Knowing him, he'd probably claim that fiancé forced me to uninvite him. He read the message and left it on read for a while. I honestly started getting pretty anxious over it and fiancé asked if I wanted to block him. Part of me wanted to and part of me wanted to hear him out. And when he finally responded, the text was so long that I had to click on it to read it. It was horrible. He called me a liar for leading him on for over a decade, that he hoped my fiancé left me and that we never had kids. It was just horrible thing after horrible thing and I started crying. Fiancé took my phone into the other room while I cried. I think he called him but I'm not sure. What I do know is after about an hour he came back in, handed me my phone and told me that friend was now blocked on everything, would not be attending and the best man and my maid of honor knew of the situation and would handle it for me. It was like a weight lifted off my shoulders, honestly. After reading that message, I really wasn't so sad that friend wouldn't be attending anymore. And our wedding really rocked. We had the time of our lives, surrounded by people who loved us, and we loved them. It still feels like a dream, to be honest. And if friend tried to show up, I never heard anything of it. I guess that's the update. It's not nearly as dramatic or crazy as what people hoped for, but I'm happy. It is extremely rare when men don't have ulterior motives when it comes to friendships with women. This happens all the time. There's almost never such thing as a dude who just wants to be friends with a girl. 
The only girls I'm friends with are either co-workers or I knew them growing up from school. Every time I start dating a new lady and she tells me that she has a lot of guy friends and hopes that I'm not the jealous type, I tell her no. I then simply ask, how long has she been friends with this guy or that guy? Are they married? Do they have a girlfriend? Do they date a lot? Then I ask, and how many times has this guy professed his love for you? Usually I get a look of shock, like, how did you know? I'm a guy. I know guys. Most guys can't just be friends with a woman. They usually have feelings for them, and if they don't date or aren't married, will literally wait around and just hope one day she says she likes him. My girlfriend won't stop checking out other dudes in front of me, and I'm fed up. My girlfriend has a serious case of the wondering eye, and I don't know what to do. So here's the deal. I, male 33, have been with my girlfriend, who's 29, for three years. We're happy and in love, except for one thing. Recently, she can't keep her eyes off of other guys. It's like she has a radar for hot dudes. Every time we go out, she ogles them like crazy. She turns her head, cranes her neck, even smiles at them sometimes. It's so obvious and embarrassing. I've tried to talk to her about it, but she always blows me off. She says it's no biggie, that she doesn't mean anything by it. She says I'm the only one she loves and that I have nothing to worry about. But I do worry and I want her to quit. So I decided to give her a taste of her own medicine and to make her feel what I feel. I spent a day last weekend eyeing other girls too while we were walking together, especially the ones that are super hot. I made comments on how hot they were, how nice they looked, how much I liked them. I acted like I was into them, even though I wasn't. I just wanted to make her see how much it sucks. I didn't stop there. I also looked at the billboards and posters of models and celebrities. I said things like, wow, or how hot they were. I even looked at the front shop windows of clothing stores and said how much I liked the models in them. She hated it. She got upset with me and called me childish and immature. She said I was being rude and insensitive. She said I was ruining our relationship with my stupid games. She stopped talking to me and gave me the cold shoulder for days now. I don't think that's fair. I was only trying to make a point. I think she's being hypocritical and unreasonable. She can look at other guys, but I can't look at other girls? How does that make sense? How can I make her see that what she's doing is wrong and hurtful? How can I make her stop looking at other guys? Update. I want to thank everyone who commented and gave me advice. Most of you told me that what I did was wrong and immature, that I should have communicated with her instead of playing games. Some of you also said that maybe she has some insecurity issues or low self-esteem that make her seek validation from other guys. A few of you suggested that maybe she's cheating on me or planning to. Well, I decided to follow your advice and talk to her calmly and honestly. I told her how much I love her and how much it hurts me when she looks at other guys. I told her that I feel disrespected and insecure when she does that. I told her that I want her to stop doing that and focus on our relationship. I also apologized for what I did and said that it was childish and stupid. I said that I was just trying to make her understand how I feel, but that it was the wrong thing to do. She didn't listen to me at all. She denied everything and said that she doesn't have a problem with looking at other guys. She said that it's no biggie, that she doesn't mean anything by it. She said that I'm the only one she loves and that I have nothing to worry about. She said I'm being paranoid and insecure and that I need to get over it. She said that she's tired of me bringing this up all the time and that I need to stop. I told her that this is a serious issue for me and that we need to work on it together. I suggested that we go to couples counseling to get some professional help. She refused and said that she doesn't need counseling, that she's already seeing a therapist for work-related stress and anxiety. I told her that's unrelated and that this is about our relationship, not her work. I told her that I'm willing to pay for the counseling since I'm the one who asked for it. She still refused and said that counseling is a waste of time and money and she said that I should seek therapy to work on my paranoia and insecurity not her. I gave her more than a week to rethink about the counseling, but she didn't change her mind. I couldn't take it anymore. I realized. I realized that she didn't care about me or our relationship. She didn't respect me. She didn't love me the way I loved her anymore. She was selfish and dishonest. She was not the person I thought she was anymore. I decided to end things with her. I told her that I can't be with someone who doesn't value me or our relationship. I told her that I can't trust her or feel secure with her and that she needs to work on herself. I told her that it's over and that she needs to move out of my apartment. She burst into tears and begged me to stay. She said that she was sorry and that she loved me. She said that she didn't want to lose me and that she would do anything to make it work. She said that she would stop looking at other guys and that she would go to counseling with me. She said that she made a mistake and she wanted another chance. I didn't believe her. I think she was just saying those things to manipulate me and to avoid the consequences of our actions. 
I think she was scared of losing the comfort and stability of our relationship. I think she didn't love me, but only when I provided for her. I stood firm and told her that it was too late, that she had many chances to change and she didn't. I told her that I was done and that there was no going back. I told her that she had a week to pack her stuff and leave and that I didn't want to see her or talk to her ever again. She cried harder and tried to hug me, but I pushed her away. I walked out of the apartment and left her there. That was two days ago. Since then, I've been staying with my brother who has been very supportive and understanding. He helped me block her number and social media accounts so she can't contact me anymore. I'm feeling a mix of emotions right now. I'm sad, angry, hurt, betrayed, confused, relieved, hopeful, and scared. It's a roller coaster of feelings, but I know I made the right decision. I know I deserve better than her. I know I will heal and move on eventually. I want to thank you all again for your support and advice. You helped me see the truth and stand up for myself. Well done. It wasn't a big deal until it affected her directly. She invalidated your feelings, and when the shoe was on the other foot, she got angry without understanding her hypocrisy. She might change for the next person, but regardless of what she said and her desperation to keep the relationship, she wasn't going to change for you. Otherwise, she wouldn't have let it get to the breakup stage to begin with. Proud of you for standing your ground and for demanding better. Like you said, she had every opportunity to address your feelings and what she was doing, but she didn't want to and she turned it back on you and invalidated your feelings. That's not love and it's not respect, and you deserve both. Wishing you all the best for a brighter, lighter, happy future. How I Managed My First Micromanager Back in 2010, I was working in a training management area within a government department. The job was fairly easy for me. When my original supervisor went on extended leave, I got a new supervisor that we'll call Agatha. Almost immediately, Agatha started to micromanage me, even though she didn't really know my job that well, or even half of what my role entailed. Now, I will say that I didn't particularly like Agatha as a person, but I tried to get along with her, even when her management style started to show. In hindsight, I should have worked some internal politics to be removed from the area, but hey, no one said I was smart at 19. The section started to have some underlying tension until one day she called me into a meeting and, long conversation cut short, said the magic words, You need to do what I tell you to do, and not what you think you need to do. She even followed it up by emailing me words to the same effect. Now I did two things on the heels of that meeting. Firstly, I printed out the email to keep in my bag, drawer, pocket, and on my wall. Secondly, I started to do what she said, and only what she said. At first, she would just tell me the jobs that needed completing, but she only got worse when she noticed the work wasn't getting done and started to tell me how to do things. Again, I complied and only did exactly what she told me and how she told me to do it. If she missed a step in her instructions, I would either skip it if I could move on or ask her to explain again as I couldn't figure it out. I was a darn good employee. I even went out of my way to start asking her what I should be doing and how, after every task. If she wasn't in the area, which was very common, I would just wait for her to come back first. If she wanted to micromanage me, I would make her work for it. She was getting nothing done. We were getting further and further behind. This went on for about a month. The reputation of our section was tanking internally and externally. Enter Michelle, Agatha's boss. She noticed all my questions and the general drop in productivity, morale, and reputation. She pulled me aside and asked me what was happening, considering I'm normally so competent and efficient and don't ask many questions about how to do the work. Michelle was a fantastic boss and generally preferred a more hands-off approach when she could. She clearly was giving Agatha enough rope to either make a ladder or something else. Okay, back to the story. I explained to Michelle how Agatha was managing me and I was just trying to help her management style by leaning into it. I also showed her Agatha's email. At this point, I estimated I could get everything caught up in about a week without working any extended hours if things changed. Michelle, being a good boss, simply asked what it would take for me to go back to working the way I always have. I only asked to not be managed by Agatha anymore. I could have been much more insidious with my request, but I only wanted to be left alone to do my work. To my surprise, it worked. I immediately started reporting directly to Michelle. I got the work caught up in three days, surpassing even my own expectations. As for Agatha, she started to have her work examined a lot more closely including her overall output since, I found out later, she was trying to blame me for her low work output. It turned out that I was in fact the solution. Michelle ended up sharing Agatha's workload between the two of us and we didn't really notice much difference. 
Agatha, however, did notice a difference as she was shuffled into another area of the department, one with a lot less responsibility and a whole lot less promotion opportunity. I ran into Agatha again after I had moved around the country a few times. I ended up back in the same office but a different section. Agatha was still in the same crappy position, same level too. Her personal reputation was so bad that only a handful of people would actually work with her. It felt good to know how stuck she was and presumably still is. I'm not authorized to go get water? All right. Now before I start, here's a bit of context for the situation. I work in the boat industry as an engine tech and parts painter. I know, quite a broad range right there. Anyway, the company I work for is quite old and the building I work in is even older. The heating system is trash and we really lack anything in the way of air conditioning and it's boiling outside right now. Earlier today, I had started overheating really quickly as the temperature rose in the building. I have a medical condition where my body can't regulate temperature well, meaning I'm at risk of passing out. I was going to go get a bottle of water from the fridge to help me cool down when I was stopped by one of the company's managers. Let's call him Kyle for this story. Kyle. Where are you going? Me. I was only going to get some water. Kyle. You're supposed to be working right now. You can get the water during the coffee break. Me. Uh... I don't think you understand that I can actually be in danger from the heat right now. So, could I please just go get a bottle of water? No. You're not authorized to leave your work before your clock strikes. Now shut up and get back to work. Me. Roger that. Keep in mind that this conversation was held in front of my coworkers. Cue malicious compliance. I got back to work, making sure to put on some extra coal just to make sure I made up for lost time. Basically, I was forcing my body into shock and heat stroke was just around the corner. Fast forward around 30 minutes. I had to tell my coworkers through my strained breath that I don't feel too good, which was actually even worse now, as I was working on deck of one of the boats, give or take three meters above the floor. When I made my way towards the ladder to climb down, I only got out of very strained, oh no, and I fell off the back and was headed straight for the concrete floor below me. Lucky for me, some coworkers reacted fast enough and managed to catch me before my head hit the floor. I woke up in an ambulance around an hour later. The EMTs were checking my vitals and were actually helping me. My boss came up to the door and asked me what had happened. I told him exactly as I told you guys, and I also told him to check with my coworkers if he didn't believe me. Long story short, I was brought to the hospital for a checkup just to make sure I actually didn't get hurt. A buddy of mine came with me to make sure I got there and back safe. A few hours later, my buddy got a call. He picked up and it was Kyle. My buddy handed me the phone and I heard Kyle on the other end apologizing for actually almost getting me hurt. Turns out he was heavily reprimanded for what he told me and was put on watch. Didn't lose his position though, so I guess I didn't fully win, but he was liable for the medical compensation for my situation. I did forgive him and just to rub it in a bit, I had to ask him, am I authorized to get water next time? And my buddy just laughed. Edit. I already got OSHA on the line and they're launching an investigation into this. So if nothing else, I just made Kyle's week even more horrible. Also, for those who wondered, Kyle is pretty new and is basically a bit of a jerk. Can I call him that? Whatever. He's rough around the edges and genuinely doesn't believe people when it comes to their personal health. He's got that kind of, if you can talk, then you can work kind of mentality. So in a way, he kind of deserved this. OSHA will have a field day with his actions. $600 to-go order, $0 tip. I'm a server, 22 female, at a Chinese restaurant. One of the best, if not the best, in town. Thursday afternoon, we had a man, let's call him Martin, call in to place a very large to-go order to be picked up Saturday, today. The cashier taking his order is the best at the restaurant, Cole. Cole just turned 18. Cole spends about 20 minutes on the phone with Martin, putting in his order. This man ordered an insane amount of food, all party trays. The bill was $599. It's only me and Cole at the restaurant today besides the chefs. The order starts coming out and I'm helping Cole pack. We have three gigantic boxes to use to hold everything. Seven trays of General Tso's chicken, seven broccoli and beefs, a massive order of white rice and fried rice, 100 steamed dumplings, and we threw in a free party platter of crab rangoons for them. We have the two massive boxes on a rolling cart and the third sitting on the line counter. Martin literally rushes in full-on speed walking with his lifting accomplice. Pick up for Martin. Me and Cole go to the kitchen to bring out the food. 
Cole asks me to push the card out with the receipt for them to sign. They paid over the phone, and he'll bring out the third box. I go out with the card, politely ask Martin to sign his receipt. He grabs a pen and very quickly marks a line through the tip amount. I'm thinking, okay, I know this man is not about to not leave a tip on a $600 order. Surely he'll tip, right? I mean, I know it's not a dine-in service, but still, it is packaged food. A lot of preparation. Cole and the two chefs help these guys load everything into their minivan. At this point, I'm already deciding how I will bring up politely the $0 tip. I'm hoping he slips him cash. I'm behind the counter, watching this guy carefully through the window. He comes back inside, telling Cole he needs hot mustard. Dude starts shoveling handfuls of packets into a bag right at the counter. I slide his signed receipt across the counter directly in front of him and say, You know, Cole is the one who took your order. He packaged everything. I point to the dashed out tip line. Martin. I know. Me. It's $600 worth of food. Martin. I know. Starts getting irritated. In disbelief, I walk to the back hallway to breathe, trying to contain my anger. Cole was telling me before Martin showed up. Even if they tip me 10%, that's $60. $60. This kid works so hard, busts his butt every shift. Not even a minute later, I start walking up front and hear this man yelling. He's screaming at the two chefs, who barely speak English by the way. That girl doesn't know what she's talking about. That jerk needs to shut her mouth. I'm standing there and he's looking at me, pointing, flailing his arms. Well now he gets no tip. I was going to tip him cash, but she just ruined it for him. Ridiculous. Martin proceeds to try and run out of the side door goes for the wrong side and slams himself against the blinds instead, fumbles around and finally figures out how to stumble out, still yelling. I'm sorry, but never in all of my restaurant experience have I seen someone wait to tip cash so long after signing the check, especially on a catered order. Customers who tip do not wait, and at this restaurant, I've had the owner do the same for me at a table. He's followed customers out who have stiffed me even, always had my back and made sure to stick up for me and other servers. I wanted to do the same for this kid, and what gets me the most is that I was so polite, and yet this man immediately started shouting at me. I feel kind of bad, but the dude was a jerk. Edit. I would like to add the tip would be 100% Kohl's, as he is a cashier and gets to keep to-go tips. I'm a server who would never expect tips from to-go. I was just helping him, as I am the senior employee at this restaurant. Is tipping something most people do on to-go orders? Honestly asking. Karen calls the HOA on me because I'm too sick to mow my grass, so I built a new 8-foot fence. So the call about the long grass was kind of the last straw. The backstory is this. My grandpa passed two years ago and I moved into his house. He was pretty healthy, but he let the yard go down a bit. The grass was maintained, but the trees were overgrown. His pond and patio were dirty, etc. Our neighbor, years ago, sold their yard to a property builder. Our properties are in an L shape, so our neighbor was using our backyard as her virtual backyard. For the past two years, I've been trying my best to maintain the backyard while also working and dealing with my grandpa's stuff. Well, for the past few weeks, the backyard has fallen a bit as stress from work has creeped in and I was sick for a few weeks. Before this, the neighbor was always nitpicking things, but I mostly just ignored them until they rang my door one day to complain about mess in the backyard and I told them, I have a life outside of this house. If it bugs you that much, you're more than welcome to do the work yourself. Following that, the bylaws came by, and they were very understanding about my situation and gave me more than enough time to feel better and mow the lawn. Well, that whole thing really upset me, and I had wanted to get the typical white picket fence as there wasn't a fence, and we were passively looking for a dog. So, I decided, forget it. I built the largest fence I could, and since her house was right on the property line, she now looks out the window, and instead of seeing my backyard... She just sees a big wooden fence. There's two types of neighbors. Ones that look and say, Oh man, the neighbor is usually pretty good about mowing. I wonder if their mower broke or they're sick or something. I'll go check and if they need to borrow my mower or if they need me to mow for them this time, well, that's what neighbors are for. The other type goes, Oh man, that looks like crap. I don't give a hoot if they're getting chemo treatment. I'm going to call the city on them. I'm 28 female, my boyfriend who's 29 and his best friend 29 female are going on a week long vacation. They uninvited me plus update. 
My boyfriend wanted to go on a vacation this summer to his mom's friend's house in Hawaii with me and his two best friends, 25 male and 29 female. We had been planning on this all spring and at some point, 25 male dropped out of the trip, leaving just the three of us. For context, my boyfriend and I have been going out since November and it's been serious. We had, and still have, been talking about moving in together and he has said, and I agree, that this is a long-term situation and that we are a good fit for it. In early June, once his male best friend unexpectedly dropped out of the trip, 29 female best friend called my boyfriend and told him that now it was just the three of us and she didn't feel comfortable with me going on the trip since she didn't know me that well and she didn't want to be a third wheel. She said if I were to go, she wouldn't go on the trip. Without telling me that this was happening, they changed the plans and made it a trip just the two of them were going on and they changed the location to a beach in Costa Rica. I was trying to figure out when to ask for time off this summer and hadn't heard news about the plans, so I asked my boyfriend which week in August I should be setting aside for the Hawaii trip. He let me know that, actually, he had talked to his friend and that she didn't want to go if I were going, so he was just going to go alone with her to Costa Rica. He said that we could go another week, maybe to Mexico City or something. I was upset and tried to talk with him about how the situation made me feel, especially since this wasn't a case of a separate trip being set up ahead of time. This was a case of me being invited and then uninvited from a week-long tropical vacation with a girlfriend of his who I had never met before. We eventually decided to do a trip together to Copenhagen, which we have both wanted to visit for a while, as some sort of compensation. I also asked to meet her so that I could feel more comfortable with the trip. We spent the 4th of July going to see her and her boyfriend in the city where they live, and although it was nice to put a face to a name, it was ultimately a very cold trip and she was not at all welcoming to me. My boyfriend remarked on how unfriendly she was, to both of us, he thought, and said that he was surprised that she didn't act warmly towards me. I went out of my way to try to get to know her and her boyfriend. I'm very outgoing and friendly, and usually this would be easy, but it didn't really click, even after several days. They were somewhat cold to each other as well. They bickered a little bit about their future and his own three-week trip without her that was scheduled for the same time as their trip. This had been scheduled before ours had. This had been my effort to feel better about the trip, so I told my boyfriend that I still didn't feel comfortable with things and that I was feeling insulted by the way that it was handled. I had tried to make things smooth between all of us and I asked him to please come up with something that could help me feel better about the trip. On a visit to his family, they asked about the trip and they were all shocked that he had arranged it in this way and let me know that they would have been furious if they were in my position, which triggered a fight in which I asked him to please help come up with a strategy to make me feel better and more secure about them going together without me. He said that he would never do this kind of thing again, which feels like not much to offer since this is kind of a once-in-a-lifetime trip to begin with. He kind of offered to not go on the trip, but he had already paid for the tickets and made arrangements, and I didn't want to stop their trip and be resented by both him and his best friend. He asked me to give him ideas of how to make me feel better and wanted me to just tell him what to do and stalled and stalled until it was finally the day of the trip. He bought me a bag of peanut butter cups and I drove the two of them to the airport. I feel so disregarded and disrespected in this situation. I want to break up with him, but I don't want to burn up something that has otherwise been really good. Update. I was really upset the day I dropped him off and he was texting me, but I wasn't responding. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but I didn't want to do anything at all in the state I was in. I waited until the next day and then I sent him a thought out text letting him know that I didn't feel safe or loved in the way the trip was handled and that I would be dropping his things off at his place and leaving his keys with a neighbor. He called but didn't leave any messages and then he messaged me that he didn't understand. The rest of the week, he called and messaged me, but I couldn't bring myself to pick up or text back. On Thursday, I think he realized that I was serious and he asked me some questions about logistical things. I told him which neighbor has his keys, etc. When he got back and saw all of his things at his place, he got pretty frantic and called and left me a long message. I was working all day, but also I still didn't want to respond. He asked me to explain because he didn't understand what was going on. The next day, I sent another text making it clear that it was over, and he got upset and sent me a bunch of texts in a row about how he didn't understand why I was throwing everything away that we had built. He left me a voicemail that was really angry that said he had no idea why I was upset and that he did not accept the breakup because he had no say in it, and he wanted me to tell him the evil story that I had made up about him to his face. I wasn't going to respond to him and I wanted to remain calm, but this upset me, so I sat down to write him this letter. 
I tried to call him, but I started crying and told him I'd just send him an email instead. This is what it said. The time that we had apart has given me some good space and time to think. I've had a chance to think about the things that are important to me in a relationship, and I see that we should not be together. I'm sorry that I've been asking for you to change things about your life that you shouldn't have to change, at my or anyone's behest. From the very start, this trip was made in an insanely disrespectful way in which it started out from you being given an ultimatum by your female best friend who I had never met that either she goes or I go on this trip, and you picked her. You didn't offer to have her meet me. Theoretically, I was your long-term partner, so this would have made a lot of sense. You didn't encourage her to find someone else to come, and you didn't consult me at all. That's enough for most people to have a deal breaker right there. However, I stayed. This is a person who you have a history with that is not entirely clear to me. Here's what I understand. Some bad rumors got started about the two of you in which you spent an entire night out with her on a trip while you were dating someone else. Nothing happened. The other thing I understand is that you were interested in her romantically at some point and that she started dating her boyfriend and that closed the door on things for you. According to what I also understand, it took a very long time for her boyfriend to feel comfortable with you being around, but you apparently worked to ultimately make him feel comfortable with you after I'm not sure how long. This is the completely unknown person who shut me out of a trip that I was originally going to go on. You did not tell me this was happening until I asked when the Hawaii trip would be. You purchased tickets in another very disrespectful situation in which I've cooked dinner and have guests present, and you chose to go into my room for well over an hour to select tickets with her and in which I repeatedly asked you to please come to dinner because you say it will just be a few more minutes each time. There's absolutely no reason for doing it at that time and in that situation, seeing as how she's in the same time zone as us and has a 9 to 5 job. This makes me feel sick to my stomach. I cannot handle your relationship with your friend, and I suppose I could ask you to pick between her and me, but that's not what I want to do. I want you to have your best friend, and I want to leave. I did love you, but I'm not about to pick this fight and hear you tell me that I'm crazy for not seeing how totally platonic everything is for the rest of my life. It seems like trying to convince someone to like different food or to have a different favorite color. I'm not happy with this and I do not want to feel these feelings any longer. There's no need for this to be mutual. I do not need your permission to break up with you. He wrote me back an apologetic email in which he accepted responsibility for most things without any argument, except he denied anything that had to do with his relationship with her making me feel uncomfortable and he denied that I would not be able to handle their relationship. He said that the only thing that made their trip bad for me was my own perspective. I wrote him back that trust has to be built, and that he put too much strain too early on a relationship in which we had not developed that trust. He agreed and apologized. For me, it ended on a pretty amicable note, but this style of relationship really doesn't work for me, and I don't feel like his responses to me really healed or changed anything significantly. I stand by my decision at this point. My wife of 7 years found my secret bank account and says it's over. My wife doesn't like how much time and or money I spend on my hobbies, which are primarily related to outdoor sports. Archery equipment, bicycles, optics, clothes, bags, etc. My hobbies take up a lot of my mental time, but given my parenting and household duties, I honestly don't get much time to actually participate in them. I went to an archery shoot over the weekend for half a day. I do some archery practice in the garage once every few nights after everyone is asleep. I might take some time off of work midweek once a month to do something and then spend at most half a day once per weekend during hunting season for two months. I haven't ridden my bicycle in any significant amount for nearly a year now and a year ago I was taking a two hour ride once per weekend. Years before that and before we were married I might have spent all day diving or spearfishing three times a month but once we got married and had a kid my hobbies transitioned to things I could do close to home, land hunting, or together, cycling or skiing. Even now it feels like pulling teeth and I don't get any actual support or encouragement to do the things I enjoy. Because I can't participate in my activities as much as I would like, I participate by buying stuff related to my activities, which I don't get to use as much as I want to. New bow, optics, clothes, dive gear, scope, bicycle equipment, etc essentially going on gear benches to optimize my equipment. My wife would never approve of these purchases, so I hid them from her by setting up a separate account and depositing cash payments I received from my clients. When she noticed something new arrived, I would just tell her that I traded or sold something else, which wasn't always false. All told, it adds up to $22,000 in purchases since late 2021, and maybe three to 4,000 in items sold and deposited to that account. 
The purchases increased pretty significantly in the past year or so, which I would attribute to me trying to find a dopamine source while I was dealing with a stressful job, raising a kid, a failed pregnancy, then conception problems, and now halfway through a pregnancy that's nearly as bad as the other two. From her perspective, I'm lying and cheating, which I get. I'm definitely lying and committing financial infidelity. I know it's not giving her any assurance, but I've given her access to absolutely everything I have and she doesn't believe me. And without defending my actions, but to put this all into perspective, the amount of money I spent is a rounding error for our finances overall. It's around 1% of our total assets, 5% of our annual net income, and around 3% of our annual net income if you compare what I spend in a given year. I know I hide spending the money because I know she doesn't want me to spend it, and I get really resentful that she doesn't want me spending money on my hobbies. The first time she caught me, she said we had to agree on every single purchase either of us made. From my perspective, this meant that she got full control because I know that her spending will never be a problem for me, and I even push her to spend money on herself. The second time she caught me, she said I could spend 50 a month on unapproved hobby purchases because she felt guilty about being so restrictive. Again, this caused resentment because I felt like I had no control over my finances or money I earned, so I eventually started sneaking purchases, which snowballed. To add insult to her injury, she did pay off my student loans in the low six figures with her personal savings before we were married. And when we were in school, she paid off low four figures of my credit card debt, and she was the primary earner for a year after I graduated before I found a job. That was 10 years ago, and we're in a much better financial position now, making around $400,000 per year after taxes together, and have maybe $2 million in assets, and no debt. Neither of us comes from money. She was on public assistance growing up, but she got a head start with a high-paying job right out of school, and it took me longer to catch up, although my current income has met or exceeded hers depending on the year. As far as currently managing our finances, all of her income is deposited to a savings and investment account, which has been going on for years. We then live off maybe $40,000 per year and save and invest the rest of my income. I don't know what to do. I know she's never going to believe me that I'm never going to do this again. I've said it to her and to myself plenty of times and failed at keeping my word. She says that it's completely over and that there's no way to recover through counseling, etc. She's never going to be able to trust me and that's ruined the foundation of our marriage and I get that. How do I move forward with her and reassure her that we can work through this? She's gone all but no contact with me except to tell me how much of a liar I am and get information from me to look at the finances. Everyone keeps commenting on the money, but it's not about the money. It's about the lying and hiding. You broke her trust, repeatedly. And yeah, maybe it is a little controlling to put a $50 cap on hobbies given your level of wealth. But truthfully, the way you're spending would make me worried too, no matter if we could afford it or not. It honestly sounds like you have a shopping addiction or are on your way to one. You even admit you don't use this stuff that costs thousands of dollars and that it just sits there. You admit you buy it, not for the purpose of using it, but just to get a dopamine hit. You admit that the spending has been increasing and it's a way for you to escape from your problems. I think you need to examine this further, whether or not your relationship continues. All I'm going to say is that when a woman leaves a relationship, she's already mentally and emotionally checked out way earlier. After she paid off his other debts, it does seem like he has money problems and they're only in control because of how limited he is. If she gave him any slack, the guy would be buying a boat with scuba gear and paying storage on it for when he can go again. Well, I don't know what you expected when you hid something major from your wife like this, especially when you already knew that she wasn't okay with it. This is a big breach of trust. Of course she's going to be concerned that you're hiding other things now that you've done this and it's going to be really hard to build that trust back. But the fact is that if she says it's over, there's nothing you can do. You've lied and broken the trust and she doesn't want to continue a relationship. You can't force her to do that if she doesn't want to. First off, two million in assets? You mean you own one house in a high cost of living area? That's a deceptive way of writing that. Do you have fully funded college accounts? What does your savings account and safety net look like? If you lost your job or were catastrophically injured tomorrow, how affected would your kids' futures be? Do you know how your wife had to live to put aside six figures to pay off your debt? Do you know what that meant to her? As a woman, as a person who grew up poor, as someone who doesn't have a mommy or daddy to bail me out, that money wasn't money. It was safety. It was security. It was working overtime. It was eating ramen. It was missing important events, not traveling for family, not buying new clothes for years, etc. She gave you her safety net, her nest egg, and invested it in you. 
In return, you not only spend wildly on personal luxuries over your own family goals, you lie and hide it too. You agreed to things to her face, then went behind her back like a sneaking kid. What a slap in the face. Where were you to object to her controlling, budgeting when she was stacking that cash as a single woman for your benefit? I have zero doubt that if it was clothes or shoes or beauty treatments she was buying, people would be judging her, calling her vain and selfish and a bad mother, and a gold digger who siphoned hundreds of thousands of your personal funds off of you and then kept digging. They'd say you were an idiot for marrying someone who has nothing but debt to bring to the marriage and who coasted on your money for over a year after finally graduating. But because you're a man, no one sees you that way. If you have an ounce of self-reflection in you, stop asking for a single thing from her. She's given you everything she has. I bet she's felt guilty about every penny she spent on fertility treatment and felt like a failure for needing that money. This is how deep your lack of empathy goes. That a stranger on the internet probably sees your wife's sacrifices more clearly than you do. Go to therapy. You failed as a husband and as a human. You can redeem yourself by stopping feeling sorry for yourself, stopping making excuses, starting to get the tiniest bit of understanding of what your wife has done for you and why you are so ungrateful. They're bringing in $400,000 a year and she's only letting him spend $50 a month on his hobbies. Does everyone on Reddit really think that's okay? Well, he's better off than I am. You only let me spend 20 a month on my hobbies. Silence, you fool. Am I the jerk for reporting a mother and her glitter monster to a flight attendant? I'd paid for an aisle seat and main cabin extra because of my long legs. It was a packed flight and my roommates were a mother, late 30s, with a kid who was maybe five or six. They brought a bunch of arts and crafts to keep the kid busy. Things like glue sticks, markers, paper, craft sticks. Sounds cute, right? Well, not when the glitter came out. The kid, let's call her Glitter Godzilla, was making a mess, and since she was in the middle seat, the glitter would spill over onto my side. If you remember glitter from elementary school, it's really messy if you try attaching it to paper. There's a lot of shake-off, and most of it doesn't stick. So yeah, the glitter and marks from the glue stick rolling off the gray table were everywhere. My shoes, my backpack, and my jeans. I'm patient, and kids can be messy, but this felt crazy. I tried catching the mom's eye, hoping she'd step in, but she just gave me a blank look like, this is how it is. I'm not confrontational, so when I got up to use the bathroom, I quietly shared the situation with a flight attendant. She promised to discreetly address it. When I got back to my seat, the mother was upset. I don't know what the flight attendant said, but the mom claimed I was being discriminatory towards mothers. And since the flight was delayed, she was just trying to keep her kid entertained. Then she started raising her voice, accusing me of being a selfish man with no understanding of kids. All this despite the fact that my lower half now looks bedazzled. There were no other seats available, so I was stuck with this the rest of the flight with this lady's verbal attacks. The flight attendant gave me looks of sympathy but didn't want to step in. Of course, the mother gave me a final forget you as we deplaned. I travel a lot, and this was a horrible flight. Not to mention it was pretty embarrassing in the airport. Not that I can blame people taking notice. Am I the jerk here? Was I wrong to get some help in dealing with what felt like a glitter assault? Should I have just sucked it up and become a human art project? Edit. Wow, I didn't expect to wake up to all of these notifications. Here's a few answers. 1. You're clearly not a parent. Yes, that is correct, I'm not. But even as a non-parent, I know it's not appropriate to act like this in front of kids. In the end, I was able to get off and go home, but the kid doesn't have that luxury. As time goes on, I feel worse for that kid. 2. Why didn't you say something? I tried initiating a conversation, but the mother made it very clear she had no interest in doing so. Between her body language and ignoring me, there really wasn't any way to start a conversation. I wasn't going to press it, considering she had already argued with the flight attendant during boarding about having to gate check a bag. Based on her later reaction, I stand by my decision to ask for assistance. I'm glad the flight attendants knew what was going on, especially when things started escalating. 3. Why didn't the flight attendant step in? I'm asking myself the same thing, but I think everyone just wanted to get home after a bad few days of air travel. In some ways, I don't blame others for not getting involved based off how unhinged people can get on planes. Not the jerk. If even a few pieces of glitter work their way onto the plane's avionics systems, this entire flight is coming down. I mean, probably not, but that's what you say to the kid with a deathly serious face. Not the jerk. A plane is not a kid's classroom. Of course, it's not always easy to entertain kids on planes, but if you bring arts and crafts, it shouldn't be anyone else's responsibility but the parents to clean it up, and they shouldn't be surprised if people are put off by it. 
Given her actions, she's just selfish and inconsiderate of others around her. If he says it's his, it's his. You sure you want to go with that? Like most public places, our library had a lost and found box. Located under the desk, people could ask, did you find this or that? But you know how that works. Until as time marches on, we get a new boss. Karen seems overused, but since my post was removed for using an acronym, Karen it shall be. Karen did not like our lost and found setup. Instead, things had to go on a shelf behind the desk so everyone could see everything and maybe remember that they had lost a particular item. This policy lasted maybe a week before we noticed a big problem. As public places tend to do, we attract our fair share of idiots and jerks, including Jim. He came in one morning and upon seeing the new shelf of treasures, immediately claims everything on the shelf is his. The glittery pink onesie? His. That well-used pacifier? His. That one odd glove that had been sitting in the box for months? His. We all knew darn well that it wasn't his and said so, and every time Karen would override us. If he says it's his, it's his. Give it to him. Besides, he's clearing out this stuff, so who cares? Until the almost final straw. One of our regulars was a mom and her kid. Toddler age, could walk, but had a stroller just in case. Usually well behaved and always had Mr. Giraffe with him. And one day, Mr. Giraffe somehow got left behind. We immediately called the mom. They hadn't even made it home yet and kiddo was having a meltdown. She says she's turning the car around and should arrive in about 20 minutes. No worries, we'll take good care of him. Showed kiddo a picture of Mr. Giraffe checking out a book. Disaster averted. Or so we thought. Karen decrees that Mr. G can be placed on the shelf with everything else, just in time for Jerk Jim to spot it and declare it's his. The entire building staff is yelling that it's not his, mom is on her way to get it, etc., but Karen will not be moved. She hands it over anyway because he says it's his. Sure enough, mom comes in and no Mr. G, but we know where he is. Someone gets Karen out of her office and as a group, we head straight for Jim. Demand he return the giraffe and of course, he has no clue what we're talking about. Strange thing about kids sometimes, they see closer to the ground, and sure enough, Mr. G is poking out of Jim's pocket. Kiddo grabs it with a shout of joy, and all Karen can do is stammer, But, but, he said it was his. While the rest of us are saying, we told you it wasn't. Now you would think we're done, but we haven't gotten to the malicious compliance yet. So, on we go. Shortly after the giraffe incident, Karen and Jim are still playing their games. Karen heads to a conference and leaves behind a very distinctive, very expensive looking water cooler and tumbler. Bigger than a one cup morning commute mug, but not as big as a jug either. Which, you can see this is coming, Jim immediately claims is his. I swear he was almost hopping with glee at his latest find. A week later, Karen returns, only to find that Jim has her cooler. She tries to confront him, but all I have to do is say it's mine and he has to give it back to me. That's the rule. We finally got our box beneath the desk that afternoon and Jim had to describe anything he was going to try to make a claim on. Edit. Karen was told by all of us that mom was on the way to get Mr. Giraffe and we were hiding him under the desk. Karen put it on the shelf and then handed it to Jim since none of us would do it for her. Jim tried to claim that Mr. G was a chew toy for his dog. Not that any of us believed him, of course. After the box went back under the desk, it took a while to break Jim's habit. Every day... Anybody turn anything in? Answer was either no or sure. What did you lose? What did it look like? It took a while, but he finally quit asking. And yes, Jim had other issues, but they don't seem to fit anywhere, like the daily blizzard of powder in the men's restroom. Darn, Jim. If you need that much powder, go see a doctor. Going to hang out at the library every day and taking stuff from lost and found. Now that's what I call the high life. Karen neighbor complained about my tree. Big mistake. One day I came home and my mom told me that the right side neighbor talked to her. Neighbor claimed that a city official came over while we weren't there, stopped by her house and asked her to pass along a message. The tree on our side of the fence is too unruly and a few branches are getting too close to the neighbor's house. The city will fine us if we don't cut down those branches. So the city was going to fine us without an official notice? I was certain that the neighbor either got the warning herself or was lying for some free gardening. It was our tree, so we would have done it if she had asked us properly, but my mom and I decided to just cut it down so it didn't become an issue again. She sent me over to let the neighbors know, and after some pleasantries, I told her of our decision. Her expression immediately darkened. 
The tree is in a perfect place to cover my bedroom window from the SoCal sun, and it gives me plenty of privacy. Wouldn't it be cheaper to trim it? Cue malicious compliance to the city warning. I told her with a concerned face that we were anxious about the city's fine, and that if we had to keep trimming it, it would be costly and a huge headache. At that point, some slight panic seeped into her voice, and she offered to pay for the trimming herself. In other words, we wouldn't have to do a thing, nor pay a single penny. A better man would have said yes, but by this point, I was a bitter man. I kept a concerned face, and I told her if I ever left, no plans to because of my mom's health, my mom would have to deal with it, and I wouldn't want her to have to keep checking in with the neighbors for fear of a fine. At the end of the day, our tree, our fine, our decision. I left shortly after. The tree came down that weekend, and so did the neighbor's blinds to her bedroom. A few years since then, and as of yet, I still haven't seen them go back up. And to think, if she had just asked nicely, we would still be trimming those branches at no cost to her. Husband got sick of hearing my daughter play the piano, so he destroyed it. My husband and I have been together for two and a half years. I have a daughter, Callie, she's 13. She loves instrumental music and piano has been her number one interest. I'm not saying this because she's my daughter, but really, I see her talent as special and more importantly, she uses it to express her feelings, especially for her deceased father who passed away when she was seven. She always says that she, in a way, connects to him through playing piano. So I encouraged her to do more and her grandparents bought her a $6,000 piano that she was so thrilled with. The whole family encourages her but my husband thinks she's being distracted from school, her real future, etc. He doesn't attend her plays, doesn't help with the academy, doesn't even take the time to listen to her playing, and every time he comes home and hears her playing upstairs, he'd lecture us about how this activity is just a waste of time. I sat him down and told him about Callie picking up on that bad vibe. He just got mad and said that he was doing my job for me and ensuring she doesn't get distracted from school, although her grades are good. We went back and forth on this and I made it clear that this needs to stop. He said okay and that was the end of it. On Sunday, a huge argument ensued in the house because my husband claimed Callie woke him up on his day off with her loud playing. He issued an ultimatum, either the piano goes or he gets rid of it himself. I asked where should I take it? He said Callie's grandparents house but Callie didn't want to. After we left, I found out that my husband took it to the junkyard his dad works at and cut it into pieces. A big argument ensued and we literally had a screaming match in front of his family over this. I gave him two days to pay me for a new one, despite him apologizing and saying he acted in a moment of desperation and frustration. He said the only way that he could pay for it is by using his savings that was supposed to go towards his new garage as a side business. He complained about me forcing him to pay and ruining his business before it even starts. He kept sending his family as middlemen to get me to give him at least four months, but I refused and stood my ground, despite being called unreasonable since it's a piano versus a new business. Am I the jerk for forcing him to pay and not giving him time? Edit. No, he didn't have an issue with whatever Callie was doing at first until we started living together. At first, I thought that as a family, we tend to get annoyed by stuff other family members do, but apparently this is not the case. By the way, tonight or tomorrow morning is the timeline I've given him, and so far I haven't heard from him or his dad. You need to leave this relationship. Sue him for the cost of the piano and divorce him for being a complete jerk. Not the jerk. Give him a simple choice. His business is delayed while he takes accountability for his actions or his business is ruined by having theft charges brought against him. Edit. And you're the jerk for allowing your husband to treat her so poorly for so long. Edit 2. The reason the family is yelling at you is because in most jurisdictions, the father could also be charged for receiving stolen property. My Karen half-sister is demanding my college fund. Background. My dad passed before I, 18 male, was born, and my mom remarried and she had my half-sister, who's 17, with her new husband. Last year, my grandparents, on dad's side, let me know that they had been saving a college fund for me, and over the years, they had saved a substantial amount. This year, I applied to colleges and got into my dream school, Oxford. To clarify, I'm American, so I'm not eligible for most forms of financial aid, and going there would wipe out most of my college fund. I also got into some really good options in the US, like Berkeley, UCLA, and Cornell, all with really generous scholarships and financial aid, 
that meant I could attend very affordably. I considered all of my options and decided that it was worth paying more for Oxford because A, it will get me closer to my long-term goals, and B, it's been a lifelong dream of mine to attend. My sister and mom did not like this decision. Essentially, they wanted me to go to an affordable option and give the college fund to my sister. This is because my sister doesn't have the grades to get scholarships and she'll need money to pay for college, whereas I can go for almost free. Honestly, I don't think that's my problem. My sister isn't even related to my dad or grandparents, so it wouldn't make sense to give the money to her. Plus, it's her responsibility to get good grades, so I don't see why I should have to give up my dream because she didn't do well. She confronted me, calling me selfish for refusing to help her out, saying I'm making her sacrifice her dreams of going to college. I pointed out she was doing the same thing, asking me to give up my dream. She called me a selfish jerk. I think she's the one at fault here because she failed to do what she needed to in order to achieve her goals, and now she's asking me to make sacrifices for her. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. Your grandparents saved that money for you, which was very sweet of them. I do feel sorry for your sister that she hadn't had the same luck. But honestly, don't pass up the opportunity of going to Oxford. I don't know about the American universities, but Cambridge is pretty fantastic, so I assume the same applies to Oxford. Congrats, by the way. I, 39 male, found out that I'm literally the backup to my pregnant fiancé, and I walked out. Now she's begging me to come back. We first met six years ago at my then job, and we were just colleagues back then. I split up with my ex four years ago roughly, and we started seeing each other casually three years ago until she asked me if we could give it a go at a serious relationship just over two years ago. A lot has happened in the past two years. She had a preventive double mastectomy due to having the breast cancer gene. We both sold our respective houses, moved in together, got pregnant, and I proposed six months ago. She's been telling me in the past few months she's so in love with me, can't wait to start our family, and even wants more kids with me. We only planned to have this one, but because she's so happy, we were even saying she was thinking about having another kid straight after our first is born, so we could start our family before she has a hysterectomy due to the gene. So she went on maternity last week, and we have two weeks to go before our baby is born. My phone died a few days ago, so I asked her if I could use one of her old phones until my new one came. She said of course and told me which one and said it should be empty really. Important thing to note here is that she actually has two of the same make but different models so by mistake I grabbed the wrong one and logged in and said oh I thought it was blank. She said without thinking she must be baby brained again so to do what I want and delete anything I don't need. After a short while I start going through the phone and see that she has conversations with her bestie in there and the last dates were just before we committed to each other. Basically, she was talking to her and literally weighing up all of her options about who she should have kids with before it's too late and she was going over her backups and I saw their chat about me. Basically, the consensus was I was the shortest and oldest of her guys she was seeing but I had the best prospects, most stable job, best personality, most common interests, funny, and good looking even if I'm not her usual type. So she said she was going to give it a go and her friend encouraged her. Then I guess we started dating. The messages stopped when she was starting to go through her mastectomies and got a new phone. I was just like, what the heck babe, out loud and she initially was clueless but realized which phone I had. She was mortified and she was spiraling trying to explain herself but not making much sense. I literally told her to just shut up, grabbed my stuff and I walked out. I've booked into a B&B and I've been staying here for a couple of days now. She's been messaging me, sending video messages, literally begging me to come home, crying so we can talk. I can't face it. I feel so humiliated and used. I've gone from the happiest I've been in years to feeling like my last couple of years is a bit of a lie. I keep going through the messages on one hand and thinking of how she's been acting the past few months, telling me how much she's in love with me, how happy she is, she wouldn't change the past couple of years, and how much she's looking forward to us starting a family together. Saying things like she has an actual crush on me, even just sending me texts with hearts on them. I literally don't know what to do. Do I go back and talk or wait it out until she has the baby, then go back and discuss it then? I'm a literal mess, Reddit. Edit. You're all right. I shouldn't just walk out and leave her while she's so vulnerable. I'm going to go home at least and be with her until the baby is here and we'll see what happens then. Can't say I know how I'll feel long term about this and what will happen next or that I'm happy but we'll tackle it when it comes. 
My husband asked me out because he thought I would be a good supportive wife and didn't fall for me until after we were dating. When I found out, I was so upset. It really doesn't matter. I love him. He loves me. I don't have any doubts about our relationship. I understand that you would be embarrassed or upset, but how you started out doesn't invalidate your current relationship. My guy, did you read what you actually wrote? She thinks you have the best personality. Funny. You're good looking, even though you're not her normal type. And that was before you made an actual commitment. Now, two years on, she's so in love with you, incredibly happy, and can't wait to have kids with you. To the point she's planning your second before your first is even here. And you're angry because she thought through her options before making a commitment to you? She compared you to other people she was also dating at the time. She talked to the people she trusts before making a huge decision? She hasn't done anything wrong, and you're letting your insecurity blind you. You're interpreting this as humiliation because she brought up things you feel insecure about, when what actually happened was that she chose you for all of the great qualities she always knew you had. You have a great relationship by your own account with someone who loves you and a new baby on the way. Why are you even thinking about throwing all of that away? I've reread my old journals occasionally for nostalgia. It's like those entries are written by a stranger. Don't put too much stock into it. Go back to your pregnant fiancé and talk to her. You feel so humiliated and used? It's because you were. Don't be someone's safe option because they will jump ship the moment something better appears on the horizon. Nice guys always moan that women choose the Chad who's tall and handsome rather than the nice guy. Your fiancé has chosen you over the others. She's darned if she does, darned if she doesn't. She settled for him because of his resources. It's not true attraction. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his fiancé? Please let us know. I wonder how many of these Reddit commenters are taking out all their anger on OP. Like, imagine if she'd be going through his old text messages and he had said things like, Well, of all the girls I'm dating, she's shorter than the rest and older than them, but she does have a good job and makes good money, so maybe I should settle for her. Am I the jerk for making my parents kick my nephew out of their will? I, 47 female, have always had a very strained relationship with my brother, 51 male. He had a very bad accident when he was 17 and spent three months in a coma. Ever since, he's been the child my parents swooned over and they make excuses for everything he does. I've been to therapy because of this for over a decade as I resented him for my parents forgetting about me when I was younger, even though I love my parents. My nephew, 31 male, has basically been raised by my parents as well. His mom passed during childbirth and my brother lived with our parents till about four years ago when he moved in with his girlfriend. Because my brother is handicapped and doesn't have big motor skills, a lot of the childcare was handled by my parents over the years, till my nephew moved out of state five years ago for his job. A couple of weeks ago, my parents were meeting with their lawyer to set up their will, as they're both no longer in the best of health and want to make sure we're taken care of. The only big thing that they have is their house and car. They were talking about how they want to split the inheritance three ways, and I got confused and asked them why three ways, considering it's only me and my brother. They said they wanted my nephew in there as well, and they basically raised him since birth and consider him largely as their kid too. I told them that's not fair, as I have two kids as well, and if my nephew is in the will, they should be as well. My brother said that what they're doing with their money is their business, and I should stay out of it, but I disagreed. Eventually, my parents agreed and didn't give my nephew his share. My brother called me a giant jerk and said that I was petty to punish my nephew for the resentment I have towards him. We broke out into a fight that my parents had to unfortunately break up. My nephew called me a couple of days ago to check in on my youngest as he's our godfather. He had already heard what happened and just said that it was a bit of a Karen move to do, but he's unbothered by it as it's none of his business. But my brother is still very upset with me and my parents are rather cold towards me as well. Am I the jerk here? Edit. I didn't expect this to blow up. Thanks to everyone for the sometimes harsh but honest comments. I just want to clarify a few things. My nephew is godfather of my youngest. She's seven. My eldest is ten. He's also the only one in the family around his age. All of my cousins are around my age, and then there are the kids. He and I have a good relationship. He's always been a very hard worker and studied hard to be where he is now, and I couldn't be more proud of him, what he's been able to accomplish with the limited resources he has. My parents absolutely adore my kids as well, and babysit often when my husband and I need help or we're busy with work. My parents are in a care home and want none of us to take care of them. They made sure that no one had to. And even when my nephew was living with them, he did errands for them like running to shops, groceries, making appointments for them when need be. 
Just because he moved out of state, he can't do that anymore. We also did it together as many mentioned that my brother wasn't able to do this. It is true that they see my nephew more as a son than a grandson. Edit 2 to answer a few more questions I've received. Me and my husband have been together for nearly 20 years. He has his own construction business and I'm a head teacher. I also think the reason why my parents want to take him in the will is because of all the medical expenses my brother had with the accident and the continuous aftercare. He'd have virtually nothing left of his share of the inheritance. I think that's what my parents are trying to avoid by putting my nephew in the will, though I'm not fully sure. Not the jerk. OP's parents brought OP into the conversation about distribution and OP gave the opinion that a will that included the nephew should also include OP's kids. You're the jerk. Your nephew and your kids are not in the same situation. Your parents practically did raise your nephew, so to them, they consider him like a son. It's really understandable. Sorry that you were the invisible one, but this was a jerk move. I, 30 female, told a woman who's also 30 about her husband's cheating, and I broke my best friend's trust. I, 30 female, have become very close friends with two girls, Becca, who's 29, and Caroline, who's 30, over the past year. We hang out a lot, and we call each other sisters. Their friendship is super important to me, but I worry I may have ruined it. Caroline works at a library with this guy David, who's in his 30s. They were flirting for two months before David confessed that he's actually married and can't be with Caroline in any way. This, of course, made Caroline super sad, so we, Becca and I, comforted her when she told us this deep and emotional secret. Apparently, David saw Caroline was sad at work and he apologized that he was the reason for her pain and said he just wanted to see her smile again and met her at a bar to clear the air about the situation. They flirted for hours. After the bar, he told her that he can't see her again, which made her sad and we comforted her again. Fast forward to the next work day. David noticed Caroline was sad again, so he lamented that she's such a great girl and he's such a trash guy and she deserves so much better and offered to take her somewhere to talk about their situation. They've been repeating this cycle for a while now. She's sad, he's guilty he made her sad, and he likes her attention, so he flirts with her and then takes her out. They flirt all night. Then he tells her they can't do this again and she's heartbroken again. Rinse, lather, repeat. I and Becca will race over to Caroline's townhouse and comfort her about every one to two weeks after he's told her he can't meet up with her again and she's desperate again. She tells us everything they did, and I said I understand that I'm privileged for her to trust us with that information because it's personal, emotional, and a secret. Now, I've been cheated on and it broke my heart. I still struggle with insecurities and pain that my past partner's infidelity caused me. Caroline knows this. Unfortunately, I know that makes this personal for me and I'm very biased. But every week when Caroline is crying, I can't stop thinking about David's poor wife. Caroline was able to find David's Facebook and showed us. This last time, Caroline admitted her and David's date got physical, and after comforting Caroline, I couldn't sleep. I knew Caroline and David were having an emotional affair, which is terrible, but having things get physical was too much for me. I made a dummy Facebook account, found David's Facebook, then found his wife's Facebook, and I sent her a message. It was very short, and I made it sound like I just witnessed David and some girl at a bar. I did this last night. Caroline messaged me that David has blocked her out of respect for his wife, and she's hurt. I'm going over tonight to tell her what I did. I'm concerned I may lose a really important friendship. I recognize I broke Caroline's trust, and she would be well within her rights to stop being my friend. I also understand Becca may feel the same and also cut ties with me for what I've done. I love Caroline and Becca like a sister, but I couldn't sit and not say anything anymore. Is there anything I can do or say to help salvage these friendships? Update. I know most people advised me against telling my friend what I did, but that felt hypocritical and cowardly of me. No shame on anyone else. It just didn't sit right with me. I couldn't tell her truth, then hide mine, you know? Before I get into it, I would like to address the comments recommending that she and I talk about how wrong this all was. Unfortunately, me and Caroline had many conversations about this situation and how wrong it was and how innocent people were being deceived. Unfortunately, her recurring response was that she knows it's wrong, but she can't even think about the wife or how bad it is when he's around. She had it bad. We also talked about David leaving his wife, but Caroline let me know that that was not on the table with David, and she did not want a serious relationship with him anyway because she knew she would not be able to trust him. We had also briefly talked about therapy, which she seemed to consider. She also had tried to get over David with another guy who was cute, kind, and respectful, 
but she said he was uninteresting and talked at length about how she imagined David when she was with this new guy. In any case, the day after I messaged the wife, I went over to Caroline's house as soon as she said she was home from the library. I brought her favorite cookies and said I needed to talk with her. I gave a very brief, think one minute, preamble about how she knows how much my cheating ex hurt me and how I'm still struggling with the damage that caused and why cheating is such a big deal to me. Then I told her what I did. She was quiet at first. She asked me if it was my place to say that, which I agreed it was not. She said she was very hurt and betrayed by my actions, which I said I understood and was more than fair. Then she lamented about poor David and how he must be struggling. This woman just learned that the wife was warned her husband is cheating and she was lied to, and Caroline's first thought was, poor cheating husband? Caroline hated the fact that he had blocked her because she just wanted to be there for him and to support him in his difficult time. I asked her what she would like from me, and she asked me to leave, which I quickly obliged. Later, Becca and Caroline both sent me messages late into the night and early into the morning about how I betrayed Caroline's trust. Fair. I was a terrible friend to Caroline. Fair. And to Becca for ruining our friend group. Fair. They also let me know I'm personally responsible if David's marriage fails and for the end of Caroline and David's relationship. I was also informed, according to Becca and Caroline, friendship means setting aside your personal values and morals for someone you care about, and I was told that if they did things I did not agree with on a deep level, that friendship meant ignoring my values and supporting them anyway, and that I just cannot do. I feel absolutely terrible for hurting Caroline and by extension Becca, but I couldn't do this anymore. I don't have the space here to write how these women are not Disney villain characters, they, for a large part, are really great women. I have seen them be kind and generous. I know they have a history of working hard and enduring in the face of hardship, and I keep remembering happy memories of our Gilmore Girls marathons or our sledding trip. I don't know if I've ever had people I could laugh so hard with, but sitting here, I can't say I regret what I did or that I want those friendships back. Realizing how little hurting other people mattered to them when compared to friendship made me feel so uncomfortable. I honestly wish them happiness and healing and I hope we all get what we need to grow and thrive, but I'm okay if we do that separately. Yeah, OP is better off without them. I'm actually surprised they went through it for so long. I would have been on top of my friends daily, reminding them how wrong it is what they're doing. I would have been the one cutting them off. Am I the jerk if I refuse to take in my brother, even if it wouldn't be forever? My father was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. He will begin chemotherapy soon and will need a lot of assistance. I've offered to drive him to appointments and go shopping for him and his wife, which they gladly accepted. This morning, after I dropped off their groceries, they took me aside and asked if I could take in my half-brother, who's 14, until the end of the summer holidays, which would be until the 6th of August, so a whole month at least. I told them I would think about it and see if it would be possible. In truth, I don't want to take him in. I would be fine with him coming over for a day every few weeks, but I don't feel comfortable having a teenager living with me 24-7. Because of his age, I also don't feel a real connection with him as I do with my other half-brother, who's 26, or sister, who's 19. My brother is unable to take him because he not only lives in a different state, but is also living on base and sharing with other members of the army. He will be finished soon, but it's still going to be about three months. My sister is not an option either, since she is now on her second semester at university and living with three roommates. Her exam phase is also starting in the next weeks, so she'll need some time alone to study and focus. I guess I'm the logical solution since I'm living nearest to them and have my own flat, but I also work full time. A lot of the time I work night shifts and sleep during the day, so he would be left to his own probably more than if he just stayed home. I don't know how to tell my father that I don't want him to live with me though. I'm already helping as much as I can, so I don't really see why I should be the one to uproot my life now too. One reason I might feel that way could also be spite. Growing up, my stepmom made it clear to me that I wasn't part of their family and would never be a son to her. I hate to say it, but maybe I still hold it against her in some way, even if we're now friendly with each other. So Reddit, am I the jerk if I told them they'd have to find a different solution for my brother? For the sake of being completely honest, I'd like to add that I could talk to my boss about working days instead of nights, but I don't like working days since I'm more of a night person. If I were to take my brother in, my stepmom would also take over shopping and appointments so I wouldn't have to do that anymore. It's just that I'd rather go shopping once a week than share my place with another person. My brother does spend time with my father every day, but they want to keep him from seeing the bad moments. I don't live far away from them, only about 20 minutes. They would want my brother to be able to come over when my father is feeling well enough, but they don't want him to be there when he's feeling bad. 
edit because I didn't proofread before posting. I'm 24, male. My father also had to quit his job because of the diagnosis. His wife still works though and money's not an issue. His health insurance covers almost everything anyway. My siblings actually are all the kids of my father and his wife. Only I have a different mom. Not the jerk and try not to feel guilty. He's not your responsibility, he's your stepmom's. So I would go tell her, no thanks, and tell your pops in a nicer way that you want to help, but you have your own life to focus on, but you will do other things to help out the best you can. But taking care of a teenager is not your responsibility, it's your parents. Focus on you and put yourself first. Otherwise, others will keep walking all over you and see that they can. Karen demands I just do my job, ends up getting arrested. So I used to work as a cashier in a supermarket. This story took place on my fourth day of work there and my second day working at a cash on my own without a supervisor sitting next to me, teaching me the ropes. Yes, I only had two days of training. I'm sure most of you will figure out which country I live in from the following explanation. It will become relevant later. Supermarkets in my country are a zoo on a regular day. However, Thursdays and Fridays are absolute mayhem at the store and are a special kind of horrible. Fridays, the store closes two hours before sundown, as do most stores in this country. People go crazy on Fridays trying to get all their shopping done and get home in time to cook dinner. If you can avoid coming to the store on Friday, please do so at all costs. I always told people after this day. The reason Thursdays are horrible is because we get all the customers who don't want to come on Friday. Now this was early evening on a Thursday at a time when the store is absolutely jam-packed. We had 10 checkout lines open and everyone had at least 6 to 7 people in line. Basically, if you're stuck with a slow cashier, there's nowhere else to go unless you have 10 items or less. Everything is going well until I get a customer with two shopping carts full of items, mostly non-perishable items. And these are the large carts you will find around big stores in the US like Walmart. I found out later he buys this for a community center in his neighborhood and he fills up their pantry twice a year. Nice guy. He greeted me very politely and then said the most dreaded words I could have heard that night. This will be a delivery. Just a quick break from the story to explain why this was so dreaded, especially on a day like today. When we get a delivery, the cashier would call a helper from the store to help bag the groceries. Usually people do their own bagging. The bags would then be placed in plastic containers and containers would then be placed on top of each other and taken to the back fridge until delivery. A regular delivery is usually between 3 to 5 crates. Each crate has a number, which then I have to input all of them into the computer, along with correct delivery address and phone number, and print out with the receipt and place copies in the crates. Even for a small delivery, this always takes extra time. Back to the story. This guy has two full carts and wants a delivery. I say, sure, no problem. Then I turn to everyone else in line and let them know that this is a delivery and it will take just a bit longer than usual and I apologize for any delay this may cause. We always do this so customers will be aware of the delay and can move to another cash if they're in a hurry. This is when the whole line groans simultaneously. I don't blame them. There was nowhere else to go. I could see every one of them craning their necks to check out other lines and they all decided to stay. So I started scanning as fast as I could. I'm pretty good with numbers, so even though it's my fourth day, I remember many of the codes and things are moving rather quickly. I get to a point where the bagger can't keep up with all the items and the area to the left of me where I place all the scanned items is just a mountain of cans and bags of chips and whatnot. I can't even scan another item because they're all falling back onto my scale. At this point, I stop and ask if he wants help bagging. The customer and the bagger are both appreciative and I help bag groceries for a few minutes, just enough to clear some space so I can continue scanning items. This happens every few minutes, it gets full, I stop to help, clear some space, and keep going. This is where the Karen comes into play. She's maybe early 40s, long brown hair, and looks nothing like a Karen, except for the way she was standing, with one hand on a hip that extended so far to the side, I wasn't sure how she's still standing. She's in my line, about five to six people in front of her still. This is the conversation that follows. Karen, hello, what are you doing? Me, not answering because I didn't think she was talking to me. I keep scanning. Karen, excuse me, what kind of a cashier are you? Why aren't you doing your job? Stop being lazy and do your job. She screams at the top of her lungs. Me, I'm sorry, ma'am. I'm just trying to, Karen, that's not your job. 
You are cashier. Do your job. Do your job. I realize now, after reading so many Reddit stories, that this would have been a perfect chance for some malicious compliance. I'm sure some of you hope that I did just what Karen wanted. Too bad I didn't know about it then, or that it was only my fourth day on the job. That's not what happened, although I dream sometimes that I did just that. Sit back and sip my coffee until some space cleared for more scanned items. You know, be a cashier. Next time. Me. I'm just helping to move things along faster. If this is a problem or you're in a hurry, feel free to move to another line. I'm sure another cashier will be more than happy to serve you. I may sound like I'm the jerk with this line, but I said it really nicely, not sarcastic at all. Obviously, that didn't help. Karen, not listening anyway and having none of it. Just do your job. You are cashier. What is wrong with you? Are you stupid? You should be fired. I stop listening at this point and don't answer, as I'm still helping to bag and scan as fast as possible, knowing it's not going to help anyway. However, I see one of my managers, let's call him Joe, walk up to Karen. Joe is great by the way, always helping the workers. Joe, what seems to be the problem? Karen, still yelling. Your cashier is awful. She is lazy and she's not doing her job. You should fire her. Tell her to do her job. She's not doing her job. She repeated that a few times like a broken record. Joe looks over at me for a second, understands exactly what is happening, turns to Karen and says, Can't you see she's trying to help? She's trying to make things go much faster. Now Karen starts screaming words, I'm assuming because I couldn't really make them out. She was practically foaming at the mouth. Joe tries to calm her down by explaining, or trying to, how me bagging items is actually helping and this makes Karen even more irate, if you can believe it. Spit flying from her mouth, arms flailing, screaming like a banshee. Suddenly, I notice an older woman, nice old lady. She must have been around 80 years old, trying to get Karen's attention by tapping her on the shoulder. It takes a few tries, but she finally gets her attention and spins her around by her shoulder. Nice old lady. Hey Karen, Karen, excuse me, Karen. Karen. What? Nice old lady. Your daughter is crying. This is when the entire store seemed to have stopped talking all at once, like someone pressed mute and turned off the volume. The sea of people in front of me parts a bit, and we all look down and see this girl, who couldn't have been older than four, clutching her mom, bawling her eyes out, snot going out everywhere, hyperventilating. She was terrified, and I can't blame her. Seeing her mother going off like that must have been terrifying, and she has no idea what's happening. She's in a huge store where she knows no one, and she's practically invisible. The silence lasted an entire two seconds because that's when Karen started yelling at Joe. Look what you did. You and your stupid, lazy cashier made my daughter cry. And a bunch of other crazy sounds that were perhaps supposed to be words. Things happen in slow motion for the next few seconds. She starts to swing towards Joe. Joe's not a big guy, but he's bigger than Karen, that's for sure. And he's not easily intimidated. Not his first Karen. She would have decked him right in the face if the nice old lady hadn't grabbed her in a bear hug to stop her. Yes, she did. I had to pick up my jaw off the floor. At that point, other customers get involved trying to peel off the nice old lady from Karen and stop Karen from trying to hurt Joe. And from Joe trying to hurt Karen, because he was fuming by then. At this point, I saw a mall security storm the castle. Our store was inside a mall. And the sea of people just surrounded Karen and I couldn't really see much of anything anymore. Kind of like football players when there's a fumble and they all jump on the ball. By the sound of yelling getting further and further away, I figured Karen was being led either to the back office or to the mall security office, mall jail. This entire time this is happening, I'm still bagging and scanning items, and I'm about halfway through this customer's purchase. I finish up with him with no more problems. He was very nice and thanked me profusely for helping with the bags, even though technically it wasn't part of my job. He said I was the fastest and nicest cashier he had ever had the pleasure of meeting. I was just happy to help. No one else in my line complained. I actually got compliments from people about keeping my composure. Apparently, many cashiers in my country think it's okay to yell at customers and just be plain nasty. I worked in customer service for many years prior and I've never yelled at a customer, even if they deserved it. Once the rush died down a bit, I went for a break. I met another employee in the back room and I started to tell him of what just happened when he cut me off. She was yelling at you? <laughs> I heard that. 
Well, everyone heard that, but I had no idea what was happening. He told me that police were called and Karen was escorted out of the store and the mall in handcuffs. I filled him in on everything and we spent the next 30 minutes joking. I don't know what happened with the kid. I'm assuming they called another family member to pick her up. I also don't know what happened with Karen after that since I ended up working there for another year and I never saw her again. Hopefully she learned to do her grocery shopping on Tuesday or Wednesday or was possibly in prison or house arrest. This was the first Karen I had the displeasure of meeting while working at that store, but definitely not the last. Karen walks out on her tab, but forgets her purse. This was quite an eventful day, and I feel compelled to share what happened. I work at a casual corporate restaurant, similar to Applebee's. During lunch today, there was a table of three young women, presumably a mother and her two daughters, seated in the bar area. Right from the start, our bartender, who was serving them, commented on their bad attitudes, excessive questions, and numerous requests. I'm sure you know the type of table I'm talking about. Fast forward about 45 minutes and they left without paying their $80 bill. It was quite frustrating for all of us because this happens far too often at our location. Just five minutes later, while cleaning the table, the bartender came across a small purse and promptly returned it to the manager. Now things start to get interesting. The bartender and the manager immediately pounced on the purse like wild dogs, as if they had found fresh prey. I guess the justification was to find some form of identification, which is understandable, but they didn't find any. However, there was a bank envelope containing $120 from which they took $80 to cover the bill. They returned the remaining amount, along with a bag of grass that the bartender decided to keep as her tip. But this story doesn't end there. The young dine and dasher, of course, needed to retrieve her purse and returned within an hour. She asked to speak with the manager, who returned her purse without the cash for their check or her precious grass. He greeted her by saying, So, you walked out without paying your bill, right? She proceeded to complain about the service, but he informed her that they settled her check using the cash from her purse. In response to her protest, he simply said, What did you think was going to happen? She left. Now here's where things become slightly more interesting. Within a couple of minutes, the time it took for them to reach their car and discover their missing grass, the three women returned determined to speak with the manager again. They claimed that something else was missing from the purse. The manager calmly replied, I don't know what to tell you. They even threatened to call the police, presumably to report their missing item. However, they soon thought better and the manager continued to stonewall them and they left in a huff. Perhaps this wasn't the most ethical way to handle the situation, but boy was it satisfying. It almost made it all worth it to witness some semblance of justice being served, and it's reassuring to know that they won't be returning anytime soon. I had one experience where I was completely mistreated by a table and they left their card. I threw it in the trash. Am I the jerk for threatening to kick out my stepdaughter for stealing from my daughter? Four years ago, my wife passed leaving me 42 male and my daughters who are 19 and 17 behind. One and a half years ago, I met Vicky, who's 47, and we quickly fell in love. Vicky has a daughter, Heather, who's 24, and together they came to live with us. Vicky and I did not get married, however, so Heather isn't technically my stepdaughter. Almost from the beginning, Heather wasn't very nice towards me, to say the least. I tried to get to know her and at least establish a cordial relationship, but nothing ever worked. She was very disrespectful and hateful to me, but also to her mother. Heather also picked verbal fights with my daughters, but I squashed that soon after it started. Heather was the instigator, and I told her that if she had a problem, she should direct it at me instead of at my daughters. It seemed to work. Last week was Casey's, my eldest daughter's, 19th birthday. I gave her a spa package treatment for two people, total $500, in the form of a gift card, and I told her she could pick another person to go with. She chose her younger sister who was happy to go with her. They would pick a date and make the reservation. Casey wanted to make the reservation two days ago but couldn't find the gift card. After hours of searching, we still couldn't find it. When Heather came home, we asked her if she had seen it and she told us she hadn't. After another hour, Vicky found the gift card in Heather's room, against Heather's protests. After a while, Heather admitted she took the card from Casey's room and went to the spa two days ago with her girlfriend. I was super upset and I told her that if she didn't pay Casey $500, I would kick her out. Since Heather doesn't have a job and has dropped out of college, she says she can't pay it. She's been living at my house rent-free with everything paid for. I told her if she can't pay for it, she should go live with her deadbeat father instead. 
She called me every name in the book and locked herself in her room. Vicky says it was a jerk move since she has nowhere else to go and her father won't pay for her to live with him. Answers to a few commonly asked questions. Has Heather done things like this before? Heather has never stolen before. This is new and I didn't see it coming. She has indicated that she doesn't like my daughters. I left this out, but my youngest daughter once cooked for the family, taking everyone's diet wishes into account as much as possible. Heather didn't even touch the food and went to Burger King instead. When my youngest told her that she could at least try it, Heather called her a jerk. My dude, is your relationship with Vicky more important than your daughter's? Of course my daughters are more important. I guess I was just desensitized to it with regard to this particular situation, because neither Vicky nor Heather can cook. I always cook after work, and Heather never touched the food I make either. What does Heather eat? Does she use your money to buy food? Yes, Heather gets spending money every week for food, gas, and other things. So, is Vicky going to pay the $500 her daughter stole? Vicky has been a stay-at-home mom since her daughter was born. Vicky doesn't have a job. Her ex was ordered to pay alimony and child support, but he's never paid. And yes, I am looking at Vicky in a new light. This is concerning. What does Vicky suggest the punishment be? Vicky suggests a harsh talking to. I don't think that would help much. She doesn't even listen to her mother that often. Update. Considering it's been a rough week and only now are things calming down, I thought I'd write an update. I sat down with my daughters and had a long conversation about Heather, my relationship with Vicky, and how I'd let it go up to this point. In short, my daughters have for a long time hated Heather. They didn't have many problems with Vicky, only regarding how Vicky always lets Heather easy off the hook. I read many comments and I started doubting my relationship with Vicky. I knew it wasn't perfect, but thought we loved each other. My daughters are of the opinion that Vicky never loved me, but that I also never really loved Vicky. Especially, Casey thought it was more companionship that we shared and that I was lonely. My daughter hit the nail on the head and she was right. I didn't want to spoil my daughter's day to the spa and paid for it so that they could still go. They went a few days ago and had a blast. Regarding Heather, I essentially kicked her out. Vicky threatened to leave if I kicked Heather out and I told Vicky that she was also free to go. After that, she quickly backpedaled and told me that she didn't want to go. Heather made a fuss, but I let her take her stuff and she moved out within two days. She's temporarily staying at a girlfriend of hers. I told Vicky that if Heather didn't pay the $500 back, we were going to call the police and report her. Vicky was horrified and called her parents. I was surprised by this because Vicky told me she had a bad relationship with her parents. As far as I know, her parents gave her the $500 and she gave it to me. After this, I was about to have a difficult conversation with Vicky and wanted to tell her that we are over, but she beat me to it. She told me that I treated Heather horribly because I was threatening to call the police and she couldn't live with that. I was relieved and it probably showed, prompting Vicky to call me out, asking if I was going to try to make it up to her and convince her to stay. I told her no. After this and a lot of screaming on Vicky's part, she also left. She's staying with a married couple that are close friends with her. It took a bit more time and energy to move her stuff to her friend's house. While I was there helping her move stuff, I was essentially ignored, so I have no idea what Vicky told them. Today is the first day of peace and quiet in my house, and I already noticed that my daughters are a lot happier. That's all that matters to me. So, if Vicky hasn't worked for 24 years, and the ex hasn't paid alimony or child support, and Vicky has a poor relationship with her parents, how did she pay rent, car, food, etc. before she met OP? I think the Heather apple didn't fall far from the Vicky tree, and there's a lot of lying going on. Good thing they weren't married. I doubt the ex is the deadbeat Vicky claims he is. This. I remember there was a thread where a dude was told the ex of his girlfriend didn't pay up what he owed her, but surprise, he actually did and he had never missed a payment. She lied to get more money out of OP. The fact that she lied about her relationship with her parents also says a lot. Am I the jerk for agreeing with my sister after she accused me of not liking her or caring what's going on in her life? I, 22 female, have three younger sisters, Ariel, who's 20, Lily, who's 14, and Michelle, who's 12. My parents have always been very open about favoring Ariel over the rest of us, likely because Ariel has a more social and extroverted personality type, like our parents, whereas me, Lily, and Michelle are more quiet and usually stick to a small group of friends. Ariel also was the only sibling who shared certain hobbies with our dad. So he especially, but still both of our parents, would show favoritism to Ariel through things such as being involved in her hobbies, having an active interest in her social life, 
praising her accomplishments and getting her nicer presents, whereas I did not receive that treatment and Lily and Michelle currently do not either. I know that our parents are the ones choosing to openly favor Ariel and their favoritism isn't her fault directly, but Ariel recognizes the favoritism to the point of being able to verbally acknowledge it, yet is okay with it since she's the favorite. She actually rubs it in my, Lily, and Michelle's faces. Just a few weeks ago, Ariel told Lily and Michelle that it was their fault that our dad ignores them by saying something along the lines of, He'd be interested in you as well if you were good at XYZ. If you want that, then you should try getting into XYZ. I only talk to our parents to stay close to Lily and Michelle. I don't make any effort to be involved with Ariel at all. This school year, both Lily and Michelle made the honor roll at their schools. Since our mom didn't acknowledge it beyond, Oh, good job, and our dad didn't acknowledge it at all, I took Lily and Michelle to Dave and Buster's and some of their other favorite spots to celebrate. I admit, we stayed out pretty late. My parents were spending the night somewhere else, so only Ariel was home by the time we got back. After Lily and Michelle went to bed, I was preparing to leave when Ariel asked to talk. Ariel brought up that I hadn't come to her graduation. I told Ariel that she never came to any of my graduations, plus she didn't even ask me to be at hers. Ariel told me her birthday last month was bad enough because a lot less people came than she expected and I didn't get her a present when I clearly had the money to take Lily and Michelle out. Ariel accused me of not liking her or caring about what's going on in her life. I told Ariel, in as objective a way as possible, that her accusation was true for the reasons explained in the second paragraph. She said herself, we aren't worthy of being our parents' favorite like she is, so just leave us be. Ariel cried, but I was too tired to deal with her and I just went home. I talked to some friends about the situation and a few told me that they feel bad for Ariel. They said she's also a victim of our parents' favoritism and now she has to watch her sisters be super close to one another while she's the odd one out. Am I the jerk for still arguing with my friends that Ariel is now 20 and is no victim now that she's an adult? Once Ariel acknowledged it and used it as a reason to actively tease you guys, not the jerk. Add in she's 20 and not a kid and there's no reason to coddle her. You're also stepping in for your parents where your parents are not. That includes with Ariel too, who's old enough to get some tough love here. Mind you, it would be you're the jerk if Ariel was younger or unaware, but accepting it and telling you guys to change yourselves to change the dynamic is where she crossed the line. You're not the jerk. If Ariel were younger, her attitude towards your sisters and you might be understandable. But she's old enough now to know that rubbing your parents' favoritism in your face is a huge jerk move. She may as well get used to being excluded by her siblings, and she only has her attitude to blame for it. She's the jerk, and so are your parents. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or Ariel? Please let us know. Looks like all those gadgets and gizmos of plenty got to Ariel's head. Am I the jerk for enjoying the Twitter fight between my ex and his wife? For context, I, 28 female, used to be in a relationship with a guy. Let's call him L, 28 male, for loser. We met in college and within two weeks we got together. For me, he was my whole world and I was clear from the start that I wasn't looking for anything casual and that I wanted us to be serious and he told me the same. Soon enough, we became inseparable and one of the most famous couples in college. We used to discuss our futures, careers, and lives after our wedding. I even had the baby's name picked up. But after a year and a half, things started to change. We are Indian and here our parents pick out our life partners or if it's a love marriage, we need their approval. He became cold-hearted when his parents stated that they would start searching for a potential wife for him as they won't approve any girl of his choice. I kept reassuring him that we could make it work out. We just had to graduate and have a decent job. To sum up, we broke up four times due to this issue, but he kept coming back. After three years, he finally broke up with me when we were stuck in lockdown because he was away and it was easier and he got engaged. I was devastated is an understatement. Luckily, my friends were there to support me and after some struggle, I landed a job that kept me occupied, but I still missed him dearly. So last week, I saw a missed call from an unknown number that was very similar to his previous number and I never called back. Then last night, I remembered that he had an anonymous Twitter account where I'm not blocked by him and it's public. I lurked in and what I saw was hilarious. He and his wife are literally fighting over there and both having a public account made it easier to see what was happening in their lives. It was the kind of fight that should happen in personal chats, not through tweets. Overall, it was entertaining to me, and I blasted Taylor Swift's karma on loop.
I told this to three of my friends. Two of them are on my side, but one of them told me that I shouldn't laugh, as there's a six-month-old kid involved. Yes, they have a baby together, and I'm feeling bad for the baby as she's stuck between these two immature idiots. But it's not me tweeting my personal issues publicly on social media. Also, I'm soon moving away for a better job and life, so I don't want anything to do with them. Am I the jerk? Please don't tell me to move on. I have moved on. He keeps coming back into my life. Thank you. The problem of love versus arranged marriage was indeed discussed multiple times. I trusted him with all of my heart. He basically used me for paying his cigarette bills, commutes, and assignments. He used to ghost me when I refused to do things his way. Not the jerk. I would honestly laugh too. Why take your marriage issues online and blast them for everyone to see? You dodged a big bullet by not being with your ex. Not the jerk. You are far from the only person that's ever lurked on their ex-boyfriend or girlfriend and laughed at everything you saw. You're not the jerk and your reaction is normal. There are some people that hurt you so much you'd give anything to see them suffer. But the truth is that if you feel that way, you're not really over him. Fair enough, but that's kind of a different situation. The OP's enjoyment of her ex's unpleasant situation is fine, but her seeking out his Twitter shows that she's still not over him, which again is fine, but hopefully for her sake, she moves on eventually. Update. It's been almost five months since I made this post, and now it's time for an update. After the Twitter fight, I quickly moved on with my life, leaving it all behind. However, today I received some surprising news from a mutual friend. Apparently, my ex has been inquiring about me and my current situation, but our friends have stood by my side and refused to disclose any information. It seems that he's going through a separation with his wife and has the deluded notion that I will forget everything and we can rekindle our relationship. Little does he know that I have relocated to a different city and I'm fully immersed in living my best life. It's ironic, really. He once doubted my abilities as a developer, claiming that I lacked the necessary spark and dedication. Well, guess what? Right now, I'm excelling and thriving as the best developer in my company. I've proven him wrong in every possible way. In order to maintain some privacy, I have only made minor adjustments to my LinkedIn profile as I don't use many other social media platforms. While some may believe that I haven't moved on, the truth is I have. For me, moving on means finding happiness and inner peace in my life, and that's exactly what I've achieved. Not the jerk at all. I'm glad you're over him, living your best life and focusing on yourself in a successful and happy future. He's shown you what life with him would have been like. He would have held you back by constantly diminishing your light by undermining your ability to be great on par or better than him career-wise. Someone calling themselves a man, but not willing to stand up for what he claims to love or want against others, even his parents, is a coward and a waste of your time. My friend had a panic attack because I told her she can't go on trips with me and my boyfriend anymore. I have this friend, Kayla, who's 22, and she and I have been really close since middle school. This all started because she wanted to go on a trip that me and my boyfriend, Ken, had planned. She packed both him and her lunch. When he started feeding me the lunch that she made, it made her start crying in the back seat and saying she was car sick. She told me that I show off my relationship and I'm inconsiderate towards her and how she feels being single and lonely. My boyfriend was upset because I invited her and she completely ruined the vibe. Anyways, I made a post previously on this and decided to take the advice I was getting and set boundaries with her. I talked to my boyfriend about it and he sounded relieved and offered support to me. He said he also wanted to be on the phone call with me and at first I wasn't sure, because I thought she'd feel cornered. Ken told me he wasn't sure how she would feel cornered, and it's not that deep, because it's not like I'm cutting her off, but I guess that's how she took it. When I called her last night, I told her we needed to talk about the trip we had, and she said it was fine and she feels better about it, but I told her I didn't call about the trip to ask how you felt about it, but more so how I felt. I told her that her packing lunch for Ken and excluding me came off as rude, and she just got really quiet and asked me what I was getting at. I told her that her getting upset because me and Ken are doing couple things on our couple trip was strange to get upset about and it made me and him uncomfortable. She actually snapped on me and told me not to tell her how she should feel and how invalidating I was to her feelings, but I said I'm not telling her how she should feel, but it made me realize we can't invite her to go on trips with us anymore. She told me that's not up to just me and if Ken is fine with it, that's that. And that was when Ken spoke up and told her he's not fine with it at all. I think she was just taken aback because she was silent on the phone while Ken was talking. Ken told her that there are times when she makes him feel extremely uncomfortable and he wants to spend time with just me and him, but she insists on third-wheeling us, 
and that he understands she has a hard time with social cues, but her texting him without my knowledge was an inappropriate thing for her to do as a friend, and he told her that he's my boyfriend and isn't obligated to provide her any emotional support. He also mentioned that he hopes she's doing alright and is able to widen her social circle, but he's just not that guy and not to contact him except if it has to do with me. I was a little surprised because I had no idea she was texting him. I could hear her breathing on the other end, then she hung up. I tried calling her back and texting her but got no response. Then she blocked me and Ken. I felt kind of nervous, but Ken told me that I'm just too nice and we weren't hard on her at all. When we went to sleep, we woke up to a bunch of messages and missed calls from Kayla. Kayla's mom and even Kayla's dad called my boyfriend's phone. I was so confused. Apparently, after we got off the phone, she had a complete meltdown. Later that night, she sent me messages about how she knew Ken before I knew him and they lived in the same neighborhood. How she feels like I used him to gang up on her and hurt her feelings. Her sister texted me asking what I did to her. I spoke to her mom and her mom told me she had to spend all night calming her down and asked me how this happened and if I told her we couldn't be friends anymore. She went on about how I'm the only friend she has. I told her that wasn't it at all. After I explained the whole situation to her mom, she didn't have any words and apologized to me and said she'd deal with her. Her sister, on the other hand, told me having him on the phone without her knowledge gave Regina George vibes and intimidated her. My boyfriend is unbothered about the entire ordeal and just wants to shower. Meanwhile, I'm in shock. Were we too confrontational? Your friend needs professional help, and even her mom can see she was wrong, and she's harassing your relationship out of jealousy. It sounds like she's had feelings for Ken for a long time, and she's reaching a boiling point. This is 100% on her, and she needs to sort her own emotions out and responsibly take space from y'all. But if she cannot take space, make it for her. This has gotten extremely unhealthy all around. Boundaries were needed years ago. Entitled mother demands I pay her mortgage. So a bit of background. My mom and dad have been divorced for some time now, which leaves my mom as a single parent to me. Since I started working, I've had to pay board and rent to my mom, which of course I have no issues with. However, everyone I've spoken to, work moms, friends, etc., thinks I pay way too much. Since I got my first full-time job, I've had to pay 400 pounds per month to my mom to live at home. This was not discussed prior and I did not get a say on this. She seemed to just pick this number out of thin air. I've questioned where this money actually goes, as surely that means the house, including bills, costs 800 pounds per month, so I assume I should be paying half. Every time I try to talk to her about it, she gets super defensive, shouts, and ends up in both of us getting angry and upset. During these discussions and arguments, she keeps mentioning I wouldn't have to pay as much if she had two wages coming into the household. She's referring to my dad not living with us. Surely that's not my problem or my fault. She's also lied to me by giving me different amounts regarding the amount outstanding on the mortgage and amount of bills, etc. Anyways, it goes on. My mom has had a savings account in my name, which she is a trustee of since I was born. She had the money from the government for having a kid put into there, child tax credits in the UK. There's approximately £9,000 in this account, which I appreciate is a lot of money. I was told growing up I would receive this when I turned 18, however, this never happened. May I also add here the fact that my mom has stated that this is her money and she put it in a trustee savings account with my name as the beneficiary to avoid my dad taking half should they split up, which eventually they did. My mom had stated numerous times she would like to get this withdrawn as she wants this money transferred to her bank account to pay her mortgage off, which she states has a shortfall of £9,000. Again, when she's mentioned the outstanding balance on the mortgage, the number changes drastically, so I'm not sure I believe her. I contacted the bank to see where I stand, and they stated that legally the money is mine, as it has been saved and earned interest in my name. They said it would have to be put into a bank account in my name to be released, which is what I did. I had the money put into my bank account to put into a savings account each month to earn interest on. However, my mom wasn't happy about this and said she felt blindsided as she wanted the money to be transferred into her bank account for the mortgage. She stated that she wants the money when the savings account is finished, but I can keep any interest earned. The savings account is only a one-year account and is due to end in the coming months. So I'm just looking for some help on what to do in this situation as she's again mentioned the money and my savings coming to an end. I should also mention that my mom is most definitely not struggling financially. 
She had me set up a direct debit into her savings account from her bank and I couldn't help but see the balance in her account. She could buy the house again at the original price and still have money left over. I'm totally lost right now. Do I give her the money? Do I give her half? Do I tell her it's legally my money and I don't have to give it to her? Money is a difficult thing to talk about at the very best of times and sometimes brings out the worst in people. Any help would be greatly appreciated. Nope, that's your money. Put into a trust for you. You don't owe it to your mother. She sounds very, very greedy and entitled. Don't give her anything, OP, and move out of her house ASAP before she, edit, manipulates you into surrendering access to your bank account. Am I the jerk for canceling the family trip after what my wife did? I, male 42, have two boys, Adam who's 16 and Leo who's 14. Their mom passed five years ago and I married my wife Rose about a year ago. Rose adores both of my boys but complains about Leo being overly uptight and closed up. It's true he likes to keep to himself, doesn't participate in most family functions but that's just how he is. My wife has taken it personally and kept saying that Leo clearly doesn't like her and or doesn't like spending time with her. What she started doing was trying to exclude him from events under the excuse of he wouldn't be interested anyway, which I thought was wrong because he's picked up on that and started asking why. So I told my wife to just do her part and that giving him the choice to decide whether he wants to participate or not and not outright exclude him. I'd been arranging for a family trip and days ago I booked tickets and hotel reservations upon deciding our destination. Note that I was paying for the entire thing. But the day of the trip, I found out that Leo's ticket had been cancelled. I was dumbfounded to discover it was my wife who cancelled it. I immediately confronted her and she said she figured Leo wouldn't want to come, but she knew he said he would go. She tried to argue that due to his moody personality and introverted nature, he had changed his mind last minute or go on the trip but turned it into a miserable experience for us all. I got so mad at her, especially after she tried pressuring me to leave him with his aunt. I canceled the entire trip, all tickets, all reservations, everything. She blew up at me and started lashing out. I had the boys unpack and I did the same which made her go crazy and yell at everyone in the house. She went to stay with her sister while exposing what I did to the rest of the family who thought I made a big deal out of it and shouldn't have canceled the trip that I promised the whole family. Edit. I'm planning another trip with the boys, without my wife. But right now, there's huge conflict in the family, and even Adam is upset and blames Leo for what happened. I'm trying to get everyone to calm down, and then we'll see where this goes. Edit. I've decided, and following some opinions here, to speak to Adam to see exactly why he blames Leo for what happened. He just got home, and I'm about to get him into a separate room for a private talk to be able to hear his side and find out why he feels this way. Edit. I spoke with Adam. Turns out, Rose told him I canceled the trip after Leo changed his mind last minute and that I decided to cancel it for everyone else and fought with her when she tried to convince me to go anyway and let Leo stay with his aunt. This is just, I don't know what to say, to be frankly honest. Adam didn't even want to talk, but I told him we needed to talk. He and Leo aren't speaking right now because of this and I'm struggling trying to clean up this mess. I was actually thinking about calling Rose, but after this, I've decided I need more space than she does. I will have the boys sit together, it's hard to do but I'll try, and talk this out so I can focus on the other major issue I have with what Rose did. Not the jerk. Your wife cancelled your son's reservation because she didn't want to go on vacation with him. Your son's 14. He lost his mother and then had to adjust to you getting remarried. Your wife is the jerk and cancelling the trip was the right thing to do. Plus, it's his personality. Introverted people, even with the closest friends, are a bit restrained, so why would it be any different with a woman that took his mom's place? She's just too immature to handle him. A million dollars worth of malicious compliance. I actually finally have a malicious compliance story of my very own. This happened just last night. I'm a mid-level boss for a second shift in a distribution warehouse. Among the many things I'm in charge of, the biggest is billing. I invoice all the orders after they're picked and loaded on trailers to be sent to the customers. Keeping all the boring technical details as small as possible, the billing system is called an ASN. It's clunky, outdated, and absolutely asinine in how it operates. If one single order is missing or has an error, it will crash the system and not put through any of the orders. So one billing error will cause 400 to 700 orders, around 8,000 to 15,000 pieces of product, 
around 15 to 20 trailer loads to not be billed or sorted to routes or sent. The orders come in four batches called POs. So last night we're working on the first PO when the warehouse manager comes to me and tells me that a customer ordered late and they've generated a fifth PO just for their order, but that they're coming in person tomorrow morning and that the day shift will pick it, only 10 pieces. He tells me when it prints out to just set it on his desk. Don't pick it or bill it, he'll handle it in the morning. I immediately tell him that if it's going to print on second shift's POs, then it will be in the system under our ASN, and that if I don't bill it, it will hit the system as a missed order and will crash the ASN. He looks at me indignantly and says it won't because a fifth PO is after ours and will be in the system on the next days. I tell him that's not how it works. He insists and says just to do it. His shift is over and he wants to go home. I give him a hearty, yes sir, and go about my night. After the order printed, I set it on his desk as instructed and sent him an email on the company computer stating that his direct instructions had been followed. Normally I'd have texted it, but I wanted proof in the company's email. Needless to say, in the wee hours of the morning after my crew was home in bed, the ASN crashed over the missing order and just under a million dollars of product was frozen in limbo. No money was charged. No customers received their pre-July 4th orders. My company ate the costs of everything, including the transportation costs, drivers, lumpers, dock workers, pickers, payroll, and all the other expenses of a large warehouse nightly operations. This morning, the warehouse manager called me, and to his credit, he didn't try to throw me under the bus, possibly helped along by my email proof, but he's always been a generally upfront kind of guy. He just sheepishly told me I was right, and crap had hit the fan. He's been there forever, so I doubt he'll get fired, but I know he'll be getting chewed out from corporate today. If you're going to run a multi-million dollar operation on an outdated goober system, don't argue the one goober who knows how to make it run. Do this next. Tap here on your screen to come see our new podcast playlist, where you'll find thousands of hours of the best stories you've ever heard. Or tap the one on the right. That episode is specifically just for you, based on other videos you've enjoyed the most.